All right, Steve and I want to thank all of you, all the fans. We recently passed a huge milestone of over 3 million downloads, and we got lots of great stuff coming up. Just so you know, coming up, Emmy winner and Oscar nominee, Terry Winter, executive producer, writer. He wrote 25 Soprano episodes. He's a great interview. We also have, coming up very soon, Dr. Melfi herself, Lorraine Bracco, will be a oh, yeah. very special guest. As will Alan Coulter, who directed 12 episodes, and uh, he's one of our favorite directors. And the great Artie Bucco, John Ventimiglia, everyone's favorite chef will be with us. And everybody's favorite villain, Richie Aprile, played by the one and only David Proval. He will be coming on. And our season two finale, extra special guest. The one and only Vinny Pastor will be joining us this season. Big Pussy, we got Richie Aprile, Artie Bucco, Alan Coulter, Dr. Melfi, Terry Winter. It's gonna be a great season two and look forward to you guys tuning in. And this is just season two, season three, you'll be seeing a lot more of our cast and crew. So please subscribe to YouTube and anywhere where you get your podcasts and uh, thanks for the support. Keep watching, keep listening. How are you, pal? All right. Uh, got a haircut. My barber's back in business. Really? I was his first customer. Yeah. You look, you look fantastic. Thanks, I buddy. So, uh, I have the, my wife cut my hair twice so far. She did a good job. Yeah. Did a good, good job. Not bad at all. Not bad. So they, uh, did you wear a mask? Did you? We, we wore masks. We did, yeah. Oh, that's Both great. Things are yeah. starting to open. It's good. It's good. So far, so yeah. good. Let's hope. You know? Let's hope. And I am excited. I'm, I'm very excited about today, for real. One of my favorite guys in the world is on, uh, not just in show business, in the world, a good guy, a good guy. One of the few fucking good guys. And uh, why? Why are you laughing for? <laughs> One of the few good guys. I don't know, Steve. Man. Why? Your life, you're not a, you don't have a lot of good people in your life. It seems. Well, I have good people. I have a, a lot of great people, but there's a lot of fucking flea bags. Circling, <laughs> always circling. No, you're right. And some people become flea bags. They start out good and then they go south. And they go fucking south. I have a lot of great friends. Are you kidding me? Me too. Me too. I mean, but this uh, guy, uh, this guy is one of them, and he's a huge talent. He was a a really really important part of the Sopranos, that's for sure. And it would not have been what it was without him. Uh, we're speaking of none other than Terrence Winter, great writer. Producer. Terry, who doesn't know, I don't know if they know, right? He won four Emmys, uh, and he wrote Pine Barrens, which uh, was your uh, one of your favorite episodes. Wow, well, yes, and a fan favorite, no doubt, and critical favorite, too. Uh, he acted in uh, three of them. He wrote 25 episodes. Of the 86. And, and also was the uh, creator, one of the creators of Boardwalk Empire and vinyl screenwriter wolf of wall street with scorsese uh you know he's a supremely talented nominated for an academy award wow there we let's go let's bring him on let's bring terry winter on terry, terry winter hey guys there terry you like that intro that was a good I intro do. I, I don't like to brag but i'm also a notary public so you know i want that in there too people should know that about me so I think at least right. I was at one point. So I, it's good to see both of you. I really, uh, I miss uh, Steve. You Usually when I see you, we're sitting across the table from uh, a big bowl of pasta and meatballs. You've got your Pinot Grigio. I've got my uh, whatever red I'm drinking, and it's, it usually uh, devolves into a great meal. But uh, we'll have to do it this way. I, I got a cup of coffee, and uh, it's about go. as good as it'll get. Hey, for now it's okay. We we've been to Bellotto's a lot of times. You like Bellotto's, Mike? Uh, yeah, very much. Yeah, very much. Bellotto's is a good restaurant. Yeah, delicious. Yep. Yeah, House yeah. Street in Manhattan, Emilio's Bellotto. Yep. Uh, so Terry, now you're a Brooklyn guy. You were born in Brooklyn. Yeah. Right. Uh, and th so, you know, there's a lot of fans listening. You know, I don't know if you've listened to the podcast or not yet, but we've been doing this for a while. Uh, diehard fans, they know every single thing about the show. Uh, and so, just so they know, uh, you started out as an attorney and yeah. somehow you morphed into 
this incredible executive producer and writer. How'd that happen? Let's go from there. Uh, I mean, I think I think that you have to go back a little further in my life, you know, to 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 really fully explain the story. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. You know, it was a very blue collar area. Uh, you know, I went to a, I went to Grady. For people who are familiar in Brooklyn, that was a trade school in Coney Island. I literally studied to be an auto mechanic, and my big ambition as a kid was to be rich. I just wanted to make money. Uh, I knew auto mechanics wasn't going to do it. I, w- I was in business for a while. When I graduated from high school, I owned a delicatessen. I hustled. I always had a million different jobs. And at one point, I kind of got screwed out of the delicatessen business by the two older partners I had. And at that point, I said, you know, I got to go. I got to get an education. Kind of finagled my way into NYU. I say finagled because I, I, uh, I admitted myself as a medieval religion major thinking that, that I would eliminate all my competition. I didn't want to say pre-law, pre-med. I said, so what's the most obscure thing they teach here? And I said, that's what I want to do. And they let me in, you know, and I, I never taken the SATs. I literally had an auto mechanics license. So I got into NYU, somehow figured it out. And, um, you know, the idea of being a TV writer, a screenwriter was just so off my radar. I mean, you guys are both from New York. You know, the, the idea of growing up and, and working in Hollywood is like something other people do. You know, if I would have told my yes. friends I wanted to be a, a screenwriter, they would have beat the shit out of me. They would have thrown me in the creek, uh, you know, in Garrison <laughs> Beach. I mean, it sounded so ridiculous. I mean, it still sounds crazy. Um, but anyway, I, I'd say, all right, well, even though I, I pushed back those fleeting thoughts I had about it, and I said, let's, all right, if you want to make money, the two jobs I knew that made money were doctor and lawyer, ended up going to law school, slogged my way through, worked at night. Finally got a job in a big Manhattan firm, and literally within two days, I realized I had made a grave, grave error. Uh, and it was, I, it just wasn't me. I was literally sneaking out during the day to go to movies, uh, you know, the library, you know, half-assing my job. And I hung on for two years, by which point I was now in my late 20s. And I finally got to the point where I said, you know, did the soul searching, and I said, all right, this isn't it. Forget about the money and the diploma written in Latin and everything else. What do you want to do when you wake up in the morning? And the deep, dark secret was I wanted to be a writer. I, you know, like everybody I knew, you know, I watched a billion hours of TV as a kid. You know, Abbott and Costello, The Honeymooners, The Bowery Boys. Thank God if you grew up in New York, we had Channel 11. It was just a rerun, all those movies, plus all the classic Warner Brothers gangster films. So I grew up on all that stuff. Plus by osmosis, I worked in a neighborhood where I rubbed elbows with a lot of guys, including Tony Sirico in real life, who at that time was known junior, as Junior Sirico. Oh, you I knew him? him? Oh, yeah. I knew of him. I knew who he was. Yeah, he's oh, okay. in the neighborhood. You've seen him in clubs in Bay Ridge and stuff. And uh, I actually worked in a butcher shop owned by Paul Castellano. It's called CNS Meat Market, Castellano and Sons. I also worked at a card game uh, run by Roy DeMeo which if you read the book Murder Machine, that's the DeMeo crew. So that was my neighborhood. So, you know, I never obviously was, not obviously, but I was never involved with any of these guys, obviously. But the uh, osmosis of how they thought, how they talked, how they acted, I just knew. So anyway, quit law, said, I'm, I'm moving to L.A. to be a writer. And all my friends, almost all my friends, thought I'd lost my mind. they like, wait a minute. You go to Grady, you study to be an auto mechanic. You go to NYU, you graduate, you pass the New York bar exam. You're on partnership track, presumably on a major Manhattan law firm. You're going to quit that, move to L.A. You've never been west of Chicago. And you're going to move to L.A. to write screenplays, and you've never written a script before. What are you, fucking idiot? And I said, yeah, probably, <laughs> but this is what I'm doing. And they said, you'll be back here in six months. I said, I don't think so. I'm doing, I said, because at this point, there was no option. There's no option for failure. I, I didn't take the California bar exam. I showed up here, did not know a soul, got an apartment and just started writing and taught myself screenwriting and just, you know. And you didn't know anyone at all? Not, you moved to LA? Not one person. And did you buy books on screenwriting? I the only book on screenwriting they had, and this was pre-internet. This was 1991. Actually, uh, May 8th, 1991 uh, was the day I got here. Showed up like a country bumpkin, did not know anything, rented a car. And uh, I remember driving down the 10 freeway thinking, God, if I died in a car accident right now, nobody knows me here. I, I don't know anyone. <laughs> and it's, it was the weirdest feeling. It was like being on another planet. And in a lot of ways, L.A. is another planet compared to New York. But uh, I just figured it out. I gave myself one day to be a tourist. I checked into this flea bag hotel in MacArthur Park. The first morning, I walked down Hollywood Boulevard at like 7 in the morning. It was me and a bunch of homeless people. I looked at the stars. 
uh, in the sidewalk. I looked at Grandma's Chinese Theater. I was like, okay, that's it for tourism. Now, okay, figure out how to do this. And it was like, get an apartment, get a job. I had to get, I took a, a job as a paralegal. I actually took my law degree off my resume because nobody, nobody would hire me as a, I just wanted a nine to five job. And people would see my law degree and I was basically overqualified. So I, I got a job at Unical, the oil company, uh, where they didn't know I was actually a lawyer. They just thought I was the smartest paralegal who ever lived because I was like way overqualified. But it was a great job. I was home by 5.30 and I started writing sitcom specs. And, you know, for those who don't know, a spec is a sample script of an existing TV show. So you use it sort of as a portfolio of your work. So like I did an audition that. kind of, right? Yeah. So people say, All right, well, what do you got? You know, why should I hire you on my show? And at, this, at first I was starting to, trying to start out as a sitcom writer. I couldn't imagine writing anything that, that took an hour. That was like, or forget about a movie, two hours of a story, how so unwieldy, but 22 minutes for a sitcom. I was like, yeah, I, I understand that. You know, I could do that, I, you know, set up punchline, that sort of stuff. So, you know, did that. And then, of course, the, the Hollywood conundrum is, okay, we got to get an agent. You can't get a job without an agent. And you can't get an agent without a job. So, I was like, well, how the fuck does anybody ever do anything? Like, nobody knows. So, I got on the phone and literally started a page one and called every agent in Hollywood and every producer in Hollywood, I just introduced myself. I even did things like I call a guy, there's a guy, a great guy, he's a lawyer now, he used to be John Ritter's partner. And uh, I called him up, I said, hi, you don't know me, my name's Terry Winter, I'm an ex-lawyer from New York, I'm trying to be a writer. Uh, can I come in and talk to you for five minutes and just pick your brain? I, I, he goes, yeah, sure, come in next Thursday at five o'clock, whatever, I show up, I'm in a suit and tie, I walk in and he goes, you said you wanted to be a writer, right? I said, yeah, he goes, well, you don't have to ever wear a suit and tie again. I was like, great. This is, this is exactly the kind of information I need. I don't know. And I would do this around, but I just, you know, was just get people to talk to me. Like, how does this work? How do you get into this? What do you, and I, you know, slowly started networking that plus writing my ass off. And I, you know, I did a thing where I made a deal with myself that I would not go to bed at night unless I did something that day to make my writing career happen. I literally, if it was, I sent it, a script out, I wrote a scene, I called an agent, I did something. So I could go to bed with a clear head and go, okay, you're this much closer to making it happen. Because it's really easy, and anybody who's right, Michael, you know this very well, it's really easy to procrastinate. And it's very lonely to sit in this room or any room, and it's just you and a blank screen. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is push the button to turn the computer on, because you go, fuck, them in for three hours. We say, oh, I would love to write a script. Oh, you should... You should go do it. You should go lock yourself in a room for six hours and tell me how much fun you're having when you come out. <laughs> but I really, I just like, I'm, I'm now 30 years old. I'm a, I'm a schmuck working as a paralegal. You know, I have a law degree. I was like, the clock is ticking. You know, friends would go, oh, come on, we're going to Vegas. We're going to the Dodger game. I was like, I didn't come here to go to the fucking Dodger game, guys. I came here to make it. When I'm writing on a TV show, we will go to Vegas and we'll go to the fucking Dodger game. But until then, I'm not leaving this room. So anyway, that's the long answer. Did the, the spec scripts that you wrote, Terry, were they original or were they scripts for shows that already existed? Well, generally the wisdom uh, is or was at least that you needed to write sh for shows that were on the air. Because I, I was like, well, God, I want to write a honeymooner script. And people are like, no, you, you, know, you got to write something on the air. So it's like, okay. Uh, so I should have bucked the system. I, I ended up writing a Doogie Howser script, a uh, a Frasier, Mad About You, Seinfeld, Cheers, uh, Home Improvement. Just, you know, and basically what I would do, you know, the idea of this exercise to have a spec script is if you're, I'm going to hire you for my show. I want to see evidence that you know how to write for different characters. So, you know, obviously there's a difference between Home Improvement and Cheers. Different type of humor, different type of setup. So what I would do, and it's, I always make this analogy, it's like kids who grow up and they want to be engineers. They, 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 they take radios apart and put them back together again. I did that with stories. I would take right. six or eight episodes of Home Improvement. I'd watch what happened, write down each scene. And I'd have a blueprint, a reverse outline. And I'd go, oh, okay, this is how they tell a Home Improvement story. It's the, he, you know, there's a cold open. Then the problem goes in episode, in the scene, first scene is the problem is introduced. The problem gets exacerbated right before the commercial. You come back from the commercial. He talks to the guy over the backyard fence, gets some advice, then uses that advice to solve the problem. That's a home improvement blueprint. Every episode follows the same pattern. If you give me a spec strip and you didn't, you don't know that, I know you don't know the show. You know, so that's how, that's the analysis and the, that's the work that goes into this. You know, you study it. So when I hire you to write on Boardwalk Empire, you know, and I see your Boardwalk Empire script and go, wait a minute, Nucky never doesn't talk like that. 
you don't know the show, you know? So a spec script gives a producer a, an idea of, okay, can this person adapt to different characters, that sort of stuff. So, so your first job, how, do, you, do you get an agent or do you get the job first? What happens? I created a phony agency, was the very first thing. <laughs> uh, I, I called a million agents and I couldn't get anybody, you know, I, or you get somebody on the phone, sorry, send me your script and two weeks would go by, call them again, I'll oh, give me another week, call back, who are you again? So I talked to you a month ago, I said, well, you know, I've, I've gotten a thousand scripts since then. And I was so frustrated because the people who were reading my work were responding, they like, oh, you got to get an agent. I was like, yeah, no shit. I know. So in frustration, I went down to the Writers Guild and they happened to have a list of agents who would take unsolicited scripts. Normally, what that means, if you send a script to CAA or Endeavor, it'll come back in the mail unopened. They don't take unsolicited material. But these agents, for whatever reason, would. And generally, they're young agents or small agencies who are looking to get new clients. And this was a complete uh, just stroke of luck. On this list is the name of a guy that sat five seats away from me during law school. His name's Doug. I won't give his last name so he doesn't get inundated with script. So I called Doug, who I haven't spoke to in years, He's a real estate agent in Long Island. I said, what are you doing? Are you an agent now? He goes, no, I'm a real estate lawyer, but I had a, a client who wrote a book on real estate and I used my fee to get bonded as an agent. I don't know anything about being an agent. I said, well, you sound perfect. You're my agent now. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm in Hollywood. I'm trying to write. I need to send my scripts in from an agent, so you're my guy. So I created an agency out here with a mailbox, et cetera, and a phone mail system and an address, and I got letterhead, and I paid for everything. And I took a day off from my paralegal job, and I hit every sitcom in Los Angeles. Back in the days you could do this, I would pull up to the Warner Brothers lot with a baseball hat and go, yeah, I'm the messenger from this agency. I got to drop off these scripts. And I go, all right, go ahead. And I go in, and I would just, boom, hit papered this town with my work. So a couple weeks in, I get a call from the executive producer of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It's a woman named Winifred Hervey Stolworth, and she calls the Doug Viviani, oh, I gave his name, the Doug Viviani voicemail system. And it's like, holy shit, I got a bite. So I, I listen, and this woman says, yeah, hey, Doug, it's uh, Winifred Hervey. I uh, read Terry Winter's scripts. I think he's really talented. We might like to have him into pitch. So I call Doug in New York, and it's Friday, and it's already late. He's gone for the day. So I said, shit, I got to wait till Monday now. So then I thought, you know, he doesn't know anything about being an agent. I'll just call and say I'm him. So I call her up and go, yeah, hi, it's Doug. I'm the agent. I have no idea what agents say or do. Uh, you know, I just say, I'm going to wing it. And she goes, oh, yeah, you know, Terry's so talented. Goes, oh, he's the most talented writer I've ever read. That's for sure. <laughs> As, uh, she goes, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is kind of like a teenage-oriented show. Does he have, like, one more script that's kind of teenage -y? I said, you know, he just finished a Wonder Years episode that's spectacular. I said, I, I don't know if I can get it to you right away. I think Terry's away for the weekend at his beach house. Uh, I, I mean, I'm living in this hovel. Uh, she goes, yeah, Tuesday's fine. So of course, I hadn't, I hadn't written this thing yet. I literally had to hang up on Friday. And this is, again, pre-internet. I didn't know like, what the format of the Wonder Years looked like. I had to go to Sunset Boulevard. There used to be people who would sell scripts, $5 each, like produce scripts. And I had to buy a Wonder Years script to see the format, went home, sat down, I knew the show, and then thought of an idea. And from Friday till Tuesday, I wrote a Wonder Years episode. And wow. I put that in. And then they called me in, and I, that was my first foot in the door. I got hired. Uh, they sold them a story that they ended up not using because it involved Will Smith's character getting into a fight. Uh, even then, my work was, had tons of violence in it. Uh, but that was my first, really my first, you know, meeting with producers. And, and it's funny, two of the producers in that meeting ended up hiring me years later on a different sitcom. And told me then, they said, we almost hired you that day to write on Fresh Prince and we didn't have it in the budget. Literally, you left the meeting, we said, we got to hire this guy, which wow. I'm glad I didn't know because I would have jumped out the window if they didn't hire me. But anyway, that was the first thing. And then a few months later, I got into a program, Warner Brothers, that I called, called the Warner Brothers Sitcom Writers Workshop. And what that is, they take like 15 writers from around the country out of a pool of hundreds, and they put you through a 10-week program. The idea being at the end, they'll put you on one of their shows. So I go through the program, they call me in at the end, and they go, uh... We'll, we have an interesting situation. We have a show we think you'd be great for. It. It's not a sitcom. This is no reflection on your comedy writing, uh, but we think you'd be really good for it. It's a, it's a one-hour drama with comedy. I said, well, why me? They said, well, it's about a blue-collar guy who's a lawyer who goes to work for a big, big stuffy law firm. Do you think you could write that? I said, if I don't get this fucking job, <laughs> I'm moving back to New York. I said, yeah, that's my life story, basically. So, great. We want to introduce you to a guy named Frank Renzulli. He co-created the show. We think you guys will click. So, Frankie, of course, 
you know, was one of the original writers on Soprano. So this was a show he co-created with Michael Grispoli called The Great Defender. So right. it's, uh, the Sopranos incestuousness, you know, is just, just spreading. So I mean, DNA. Michael. Yeah, it's amazing. Frankie, of course, is, you know, one of the great writers and, and um, hands down one of the funniest people easily. Literally, you know, when you say somebody's so funny, they almost they made you pee your pants. Frankie literally almost had me pee in my pants once. He was telling me a story, and I, and I mean, it was, I was almost lost it. I mean, just, just incredible, incredible funny guy. So anyway, we went on. Unfortunately, that show didn't go very long. We went on to different jobs. And then a couple years later, my agent sends me the pilot of The Sopranos. I call Frankie. He's my second call. My first is the agent. And Frankie says, yeah, I'm meeting this guy, David Chase. I said, you got you to gotta get me in there. And the rest is history. So you meet David. You finally meet David. Well, how's that go? You know, you meet him in New York, you fly back, what's that? No, season, season two. Season two, yeah. I end up, I, I, I call Frankie, he said, yeah, I'm actually meeting David uh, on Friday. I'm meeting this guy, David Chase. Frankie meets him, turns out Frankie's the last writer David hired for season one, and then the door's shut. So I was out. So I, in the meantime, I was writing my, what became my first feature, a movie called Brooklyn Rules. It's a movie about me and my two best friends growing up in New York, and it had some mob components. Stuff. So I thought, oh, this would be a great sample for David. So, you know, season one starts, and as it goes on shows, not all the writers David hired worked out. Most of them actually did not. They got fired pretty quickly. The only ones who survived were Frankie, Robin Green, and Mitch Burgess. And that's it, like season. And the funny thing is, you know, as David well knows, as Frankie was writing on season one, he would come home and he would tell me about the writers' room, and we'd riff and pitch. I'd pitch him stories, and he'd pitch them to David. He'd write scenes and send them to me, and I'd edit them and I'd add a line or two. So I was kind of writing on the show a little, even though I wasn't. So anyway, as things started to fall apart with the original writing staff, I finished my feature and I said to Frankie, this is a great sample for David because it's got neighborhood stuff. So David reads it and hates it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, Frankie really? He goes, yeah, he does not like it. Really? Yeah, I thought I just shot myself in the foot. <laughs> so anyway, season two comes along and David's ready to hire more people. And Frankie, you know, to his credit, said to David, look, I know you don't like that script. you got to trust me on this guy. I know he can write the show. And David said, all right, I'm, uh, you, you're vouching for the guy, I'll meet him. So David and I met, it was me, David, Robin, and Mitch, and uh, we started talking about a potential story. And the idea was David was going to give me a script to write. And uh, they said, yeah, we're thinking about, you know, maybe Chris, you know, Chris wants to get into Hollywood and acting. I said, you know, when I started out writing, I, I took an acting class. I said, the funny thing is, like, they say that writers should take acting classes to, to sort of understand what actors are asked to do. And we used to do all well, these goofy exercises like A, B, A, B. And that sort of morphed into the story of Michael, of Christopher taking the first acting class. That was the first script I wrote, uh, Big Girls Don't Cry, that whole storyline. That was right out of, of my experience, you know, which was so That's great. It was so much of what we put into the show came literally right out of our lives or, you know, or, or, or your life. You would tell me something, I would end up putting it in a script. <laughs> or Jim, oh, that's, the, uh, that's the episode we're doing today. We're, we're going to go over that one. And oh, I, 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 I was going to ask you about acting classes. Do you, do you know, remember the class you went to? It was called Victor. We used to call the guy Victor Velasco. But that's the guy from uh, <laughs> Barefoot in the Park. Uh, it'll come to me before the end of this. Victor something. Uh, it was on Bond Street in Manhattan. Oh, in Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. So, we Terry. Did, uh, actually, actually, I got I to gotta say, my, my scene partner for the duration of the acting class was Chris Caldamino, who later went on to, on to the surrounds of Mortal Empire. He played Billy Leotardo. So one right. of the first things we had to do was do a scene from Of Mice and Men. So I was George and he was Lenny. So we do the whole ending scene where I have to shoot Chris in the head. And, the, and I, I, they had a prop gun, but it was all they had was like a, a ray gun. So I was going to use the ray gun, you know, just hold the gun on him. So anyway, Chris gets down, and uh, I say, I'll look at the rabbits. You know, Lenny, look across, and one day we'll have rabbits. And I'm getting, and, and I shoot him in the head, and I pull the trigger of the ray gun, and it goes, <laughs> and, you know, so it's supposed to be this big dramatic scene. <laughs> he falls down dead. And, you know, I vaporized them, basically. And it's this whole big, you know, dramatic ending that ended up being, you know, a comedy. But uh, anyway, with the two of us doing it, I'm sure it was. But anyway. So, so, so you got hired for one episode? One episode. Oh, you, you, you weren't on the staff. So the, no, the episode, Big Girls, 
Yeah, Big Girls was, Don't Cry was your audition. Yeah, and I was at the time I was working on the PJs, which was a Eddie Murphy claymation comedy on Fox, uh, created by Larry Wilmore and Steve Tompkins. Very funny show, uh, but but a hard show to work on. I mean, we had the hours of grueling. It was like literally, I can't tell you how many times we came home with the sunrise, you know, of writing all night, crazy, crazy stuff. So. The Sopranos, knowing that this was the audition, this was my shot. I knew this was a career-changing, life-changing opportunity. And I had been working as a writer for six or seven years by that point. So I was doing fine, but this was going to change everything. So I had to write this script while I had my day job on the PJ. So I was getting up at 3 in the morning. I'd work from 3 to 7 on the Soprano script and then go to work and do this. So meanwhile, Renzulli, who's my inside guy, says, yeah, you're, you and another guy are writing scripts. This guy, Todd Kessler. And I was like, okay, what's he? Hey, he seems like he's talented. He's a nice guy. He's funny. He's got, so, you know, now I'm thinking in my head, it never occurred to me that David could hire both of us. I'm thinking it's either me or him. So I'm like, shit. So I, you know, I give it my best shot. I hand the script in, waiting, waiting. David's reading. Todd hands his script in. Frankie calls me a couple of days later. I go, How, how's, how's Todd's script? He goes, it's really good. I go, you kidding me? Fuck, really? I was really hoping he would shit to bed, but he, he did. You know, neither did I. So David ended up hiring both of us. So I was like, oh, my God, thank thank God. So that was that, it. That's season. before season two actually started. Yeah, season one was still airing. But I got to see, it was, it was a real treat because when I, when I went off to write my episode, uh, I think episode eight or nine of season one was on the air. So I said to David, well, it really helped me to know what happens in the rest of the year, season. So I ended up going home with four videotapes back in the days when they had videotapes of the rest of the Sopranos. So I got to see the ending of season one a month before the rest of the world did. So yeah, I was hired, but you know, basically I started as a writer as the series was starting a rerun for the first time. And it was in the first rerun that it's the, the groundswell started. People started telling their friends, did you see this thing? You got to check this thing out. So as that built, by the time we started shooting season two, it was crazy. And I, Michael may remember this. We were on a location shooting an episode for season two, and uh, he and Drea came out of a trailer somewhere in New Jersey at night. And there was a crowd of people that just started applauding. And I remember you and Drea looked at each other and like, what the fuck is going on? This yeah, was one of the first right. times. Because you guys shot season one in anonymity. Nobody knew who the hell you were, what you were right. doing. You guys came out, and you were already Chris – and Adriana, and, and you guys looked at each other like, wow, what's happening? And we started to need security, and it was pretty crazy. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, without, you know, blowing smoke up each other's asses, you, you were amazing. I mean, you, you were so good. The, all of the, uh, the, the glass menagerie stuff, and it, was, it was really great, and uh, the James Dean stuff. I haven't, you know, full disclosure, I have only seen Pine Barrens a couple of times since the show went off the air. I have not seen a, sh a scene of the show in, how, what, what is it, 13 years now? Uh, yeah. Same with Boardwalk Empire. I just, I tend to not look back. But my kids are now getting to the age where like in another couple of years, they're probably old enough to sit down and we'll watch it all together and that's what I'm gonna do. So I know my memory's not as good as it was in terms of this. I used to be the go-to guy. David would call me and say, what episode did such and such happen? And I can, in a nanosecond, I can tell you now, I'm like, I got to really think about it. Well, we haven't seen them either. I mean, since we started doing this, then yeah. we went back, you know. Uh, and then I, I, and I told, I think I told Michael the story before, but when I auditioned, it was, I came in the second episode of the second season and it was at Silver Cup and there was like hundreds of people there, right? right? Or at least a hundred. And I came in and I just, you were there and I, course i didn't have any idea who you were and i just said where do you sign in and you went i think it's down there and so i went i signed in i waited when i went in to read for david and 15 other people i saw you in the room and i said to my because i was green i went what do they do let the fucking actors stay do they let them yeah, stay and watch the other actors i mean <laughs> i had no idea and then i once i got the show i i realized that you were a producer and a writer on it. Also, in, in uh, Big Girls Don't Cry, I think you told me the scene where Furio goes in to beat up the uh, uh, in the Hull House, right? Yeah. He goes in to beat up the 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 woman and her husband and blah blah right. blah. Now, 
wasn't that the last scene of the day or something that we said we shot that at four we were pulling the plug at four thirty in the morning and it was a Friday night and it was a long, long day and we, it was a location in New Jersey. So it wasn't anything we could go back to on a set. We needed to get it. And it was a very complicated shot. And Tim wanted Tim Van Patten directed the episode, did a phenomenal job, wanted to do this in one shot. And as it turned out, we only had time to do it once. And uh, that was Federico's first episode. Even though he appeared in the Italy episode, the Italy episode was actually shot after Big Girls Don't Cry in the schedule. So this was one of the first days that Federico ever worked. And he was asked to do an incredible, uh, incredibly sophisticated stunt uh, sequence. Starts with Tony in the car, cameras over his back, follows him into the door of the whorehouse, boom, smack this person. Another guy comes out, knock him down, pick up a gun, go into the back. And, and what you see on TV was one take, the only take of that. We got it at exactly 4.30 when, boom, that's a wrap. Go home. And it was like, wow, it was really magical. And that was, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, oh, so much to Tim, Federico, the camera department. Everybody was perfect. Every actor in that scene just was kind of flawless. And it was really, I, mean, I don't know that I've ever been so proud of anything that I've worked on or shot since. That's, really wow. Great. That's incredible because it's very it complicated. Amazing. That's very, shot complicated. Is very complicated. And it was all on Federico. I mean, it was like this guy, he literally, this was like his second day on the job uh, and, and just nailed it. I mean, really, it was a lot to do. And, and knowing the pressure, it's like, this is our only shot at this. You, got, you cannot mess anything. Great. Yeah, it was really amazing. You know, we had uh, George Ann and uh, Sheila on, the casting yeah. directors, of course. Could you tell us anybody else that was up for roles or you guys tried to get or talked about getting or you remember anything like that? Like, hey, right. wouldn't this guy be great? Or You know, it's interesting. You know, I, one of the casting uh, sessions I remember was really challenging. Uh, one of many was Richie Aprile. Uh, you know, we had a lot of actors who came in. Uh, you know, uh, Ed O'Neill came in and read. was really great. Um, trying to think of any other name actors. One guy who's a, I can't remember his name, Italian. He had been a football player. And maybe Ed Marinaro. Ed Marinaro. And, and you know, a lot of these guys were big. Some of them were even bigger than Jim. And it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't working. Jim was just so overpowering. And, and, and it turned out that the guy who was the most menacing turned out to be uh, David Provo who came in and David's probably, you know, five, eight, five, nine, but it's all in those eyes. And, and, and he, it's obviously not a physical thing, but th there's such a menace there. And you saw him and him stand up to Jim and you went, okay, yeah, I believe this guy, the only other guy, not to take anything away from Ed Marinaro or, or, or Ed O'Neill. Uh, is it Ed Marinaro? I'm sorry. A lot of Ed's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I take anything away from those guys. They're great, but it just wasn't clicking. But David Provo was so scary. And uh, it was just that 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 worked. It was interesting. You know, casting Federico. You know, we went through so many guys. Because of course, we wanted them to speak Italian, and we got guys. And and um, I don't know. It was like every guy sounded like Mr. Bocciagalup from Avon and Costello. <laughs> hey, go, go, go. It's like, and what I was a like, oh, a banana, God. to a banana. It was horrible. And then finally, this guy walks in. And he's got to, and literally, and I've said this to Federico, and it's the God's honest truth. He is exactly what I thought about when I wrote that character. He is precisely the image of the guy. I thought he walks in, he's big, he's physical, he speaks Italian, and he does the scene. And then I thought, okay, here's the deal. He's not going to be able to pull off the violence, the physical stuff. I had worked on a show actually with Michael Rispoli, The Great Defender, and we had an actor who had to throw a punch in a scene. And, and you, we didn't think to ask the guy okay, to let us see you throw a punch. And it was, it was when the, on the day the guy had to throw a punch, it was clear that he never threw a punch before. And it looked, it was so absurd looking, you know, it came, it came yeah, not to keep referencing Adam Costello, but remember Stinky? And he was, he was uh, uh, that was how the guy threw a punch. And I was like, this is the big, the culmination of the episode. So now I'm thinking this guy Federico, he's probably going to do a Stinky and go, uh, I'll harm you. And uh, he, he, he mined the violence, and it was like, holy shit, this guy is the guy. And he, so David says to him, so where in Italy are you from? He goes, oh, I'm, I'm from Patterson, New Jersey, breaking accent. 
And we almost fell out of our chairs. Like this guy is like literally, but this is why I thought to myself, this show is blessed. I mean, how fucking lucky are we to go? Cause that cast was already Mount Rushmore to me to add another face in there to go, is this, is this going to work? We're going to throw in some other guy. And he just fit. It just fit beautifully. Really worked. You know, Joey pants was another one. Uh, the same thing, you know, had the same thing with the, uh, as David Provo. Joey's not a big guy, but he's got crazy behind those eyes. And, and, you know, you just believe this is a guy you should be afraid of. Yeah. David just brought that sense that he just doesn't care if he lives or dies and he'll go, yeah. you might beat him, but he'll go, you know, you're going to have to kill him. To beat him. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. The, funny, the irony is he's not the nicest guy in the world. He's so sweet. Sweetheart. Yeah. Just, yeah. It totally yeah. turned on. Did everybody, everybody have to read? Did anybody give a get a role without reading? Not that I know. Uh, not that I know of. I think David, David's policy was: I just need to see you do it. You know, it's no offense. Don't be offended. I just this is a, we're making a huge investment in, in you and we just need you to, I just need to hear it. And uh, I think Mike Nichols even read Mike Nichols actually read to play Carmela's uh, therapist that Carmela went, that was brilliantly played by Sully Boyer. And Mike Nichols read it actually was at a, uh, at the read through at the end of the read through, he came up to David. He said, I don't think I'm right for this. Part. <laughs> and really? David's like, talking about it. He goes, I, I don't, I'm telling you, I'm not right for this. And David said, I thought you did a great job. He says, thank you, but I, I think you should get somebody else. He said, I'd love to be on your show, but I, I'm telling you as a director myself, I'm not the right guy. Wow. And, David, and, uh, wow. and he left and he got Sully Boyer and uh, it was actually the last thing Sully Boyer did. Sully Boyer was the bank president in Dog Day Afternoon. And great was, guy. Uh, yeah. Great yeah. actor. I, uh, yeah. I liked That's him a lot. the last thing he ever did before he passed away. Was it really? Yeah. He yeah. was in a lot of movies. He, yeah. Uh, yeah, he were, yeah. He and Edie together, which, long time. Which, which is great. And did, uh, uh, Terry, did anybody supposed to get killed off that didn't get killed off or vice versa? Anything like that? Uh, that you well, remember? The, certainly the, uh, the Dan Grimaldi resurrection was one of the, uh, one of the big ones. You know, Dan uh, originally played a character named Philly Parisi. And it was in the beginning of the second season, I think. And Philly Parisi got shot uh, in a car. And David, you know, afterwards said, God, that was so stupid. I didn't know this guy was going to be so good. I never would have killed him. So David said, all right, we can do this once per TV series. He has a twin <laughs> brother. He goes, I'm playing the twin card for this guy because he's so good. And we brought him back as his own twin brother, Patsy Parisi, who then lived on till the end of the show. Um... In terms of other people, uh, you know, there were untimely deaths. You know, I think, uh, you know, Gigi Sistone, uh, unfortunately, I think, you know, that death came about as a, as a means of, you know, moving, moving around crew people, like in the, not, that, not uh, our crew, but the mob crew. You know, we needed to move him out so Ralph could take over. So we, instead of, you know, I, you know, sadly, you know, killed him. Um, Steve Buscemi, I think we kind of backed ourselves into a corner story-wise with him. I remember big debates in the writer's room, you know, that he had to go. I mean, there was no question that, that he had to go. I mean, and anything less than that would feel phony. Richie April is another one. That guy was so menacing. We're like, where does, how does Tony not kill this guy? And that was our fault. You know, we, we made that character so there's no turning back. You know, it's like, you know, and I remember also yeah. the you know, debates in the writer's room. If Tony doesn't kill this guy, he's an idiot. Uh, you know, because he's, he's just asking to get killed himself. So then the, the challenge was, all right, how does he die, but not in an obvious way? And somebody came up, well, Janice kills him. And then that was a surprise, and that turned out to be one of the high points of season two. For sure. Right. The great thing was I, we used to tease Tony Sirico about killing him. First thing Tony Sirico ever said to me, <laughs> Literally on day one, I've said this before. He said, you're, "You're the new writer." He said, "Let me tell you something." He goes, "You ever write a script where I die?" He goes, first I die, then you die." <laughs> and I was like, right. "Okay." He goes, "I'm telling you, don't fucking think about killing me." And and uh, you know, we used to every once in a while we would we would type up a phony script page that had Paulie dying and leave it around, and he got wise to that after a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, uh, I you always make him a rat. That you oh, make him a rat, rat either. Yeah. That was forbidden. Yeah. You remember in season one, oh, you weren't there in season one, but there was that episode where uh, the madam that Macasian was, you know, uh, yeah. involved with said, uh, Paulie, uh, Macasian always thought Paulie was a, uh, a psycho or something, but they said he was a bully. And Paulie and Sirico said, you can't call me a bully, but it was okay to call him a psycho. <laughs> <laughs> He was okay with being called a psycho, but not being called a bully. That's that so good. That's so good. I, I always thought uh, it would be him or Pussy would get killed. Right. One or the other. Was there a choice at any point, or it was yeah. just Vinny and that? Uh, no, Vinny it, was all, it was always Vinny. I mean, that, that storyline for, uh, for season two, it was interesting. When I came on to the series, in the beginning of season two, we started plotting out the season. Um, Pussy had disappeared at the end of season one, and David Chase went off to France to, to have a long vacation. And he was away for the groundswell of popularity of the show. He didn't understand the, the chatter that was going on around people. What a, I guess he knew it was a hit, but he didn't understand what people were talking about. Everybody wanted to know what happened to Pussy, where's Big Pussy, what's going on. So when we started plotting out season two, Pussy wasn't even on the radar. So I, I brought up, I said, well, what about Pussy? And David goes, nobody cares about him. He's a minor character. I said, David, are you, I don't think you're aware. This is like before the internet really took off. I don't think you're aware of, of how much people want to know about this guy. And, you know, he, I guess he asked around. He's like, holy shit, this is, yeah, this is what we need to write to. That's the mystery. So the whole season was now, okay, where was Pussy? So now we answer that question. Unfortunately for Vinny, the conclusion was, well, he was taken in and flipped by the FBI. And that whole season slowly unraveled where we find that out. And then, of course, Tony finds it out. And there's only one thing that can happen. So uh, sadly, you know, that was the answer. And it had to end the way it ended. So yeah. there was never a question. I mean, there was some question during the season of who was flipping, who was wearing a wire. And I guess there was a question that maybe it was Paulie at some point. But in our minds, it was never never a question do you remember any storylines that never material yeah you know, that never you know became in put into scripts like that were talking very about few. The there were there were very few i can maybe count on two fingers stories i remember that didn't go we you know i, I used to like to say that you know we, even our scraps of story ideas we ended up making soup out of everything Every, we had a, a storyboard like on one of the walls in the writer's room, just notions that we wanted to yeah. get to. I remember by the end, we had checked off almost every little obscure thing we wanted to get to. You know, like Bear in New Jersey. You know, boom, that was a whole episode. You know, things we wanted to do. There was one episode uh, during the, uh, the sequence of episodes where Tony was in the hospital where we wanted to do uh, a script about... Uh, I think it was called the se the sixth floor or the fifth floor uh, about the privilege of rich people in hospitals that like, you know, a fancy hospital in New York, there's a floor that you don't know about. The average person doesn't know about, but if you're a celebrity or you're a rich person, that's where you go. And it's not like any of the other floors. It's like, Oh, they rooms where the family can stay and the, you know, and basically Tony, you know, pulls some strings to get that special treatment. But by the point in that storyline, we just felt like we've been in that hospital so long, you know, let's not do it. I think, we might have actually had a script that was even written. Um, there was another script I think Matt Weiner reminded us of recently that he wrote that was sort of about the home life of the female FBI agent who was flipping Adriana. Like we got to spend time with her at home, and I'm not really sure. Maybe Tony had an affair with her or something like that, and that never really got any traction. But very – something's telling me you might have been involved in a storyline about a mentally ill guy outside the pork store. Yeah, like, who, was, uh, who was obsessed with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> oh, obsessed with the Rolling Stones and the, and the, 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 uh, the um, fluorescent <laughs> pig in the window. Oh, yeah, we can yes. never really them. That's really like the three, I, you know, I, I, I remember that never got going. I remember I had pitched one, uh, an episode where Tony finds a, uh, a young kid breaks into his house. And when Tony's, Tony's the only one there and Tony gets this kid, and catches the kid, and then they're stuck. He he's stuck. He doesn't know what to do, and he ends up killing the kid. The kid's just this burglar, but the kid now like has already like I forget how it how it ended up turning out. But Tony, it's this episode that the whole thing takes place entirely in the house. It's just Tony and this kid, and he ends up killing him rather than let him go. Uh, that never obviously we never did that too. But 
Yeah, the mentally ill guy was obsessed with Andrew Lug Olden. 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 Yeah, Olden. That's right. The producer. He was, I guess, the yeah. producer for the yeah, yeah, or yeah, manager. Yeah. Manager. I don't remember. But uh, yeah. there was also one other one that that we never did. Uh, it was. I remember seeing it on the whiteboard. A rat and nobody cares. So there was like a rat who got out of prison, who was, and right. nobody gave that a was, shit anymore. But one one of the guys was like, "We got to get this guy," but nobody cared at this point. Well, so that's many. the thing too. It's like it's it sort of goes back to like the Sammy Gravano thing. You know, he's out and he's saying, "Okay, here's my address. I'm in Arizona. If anybody wants to come get me, here I am." And you're like, "Well, who? You got to really have a very serious grudge." to go to Arizona and confront that guy. So unless it's very personal, you know, you gotta, what you'll say is, oh, somebody should do that. Not me. I'm not getting involved. But So that was sort of the, uh, the genesis of that. It's like, you know, yeah, uh, the rules say that this rat should go, but I'm not fucking I'm not going. To but there's my- a guy in Vegas, which we talked about, Frank Collada, and he is giving tours of where they killed people. <laughs> and committed crimes. You could go to Vegas now and you wow. could take a tour. That's unbelievable. That it's unbelievable. unbelievable. And he, he was a rat? He, was a, uh, he became a rat, and he was a technical yeah. advisor on casino. And he's around, and he's alive and well. I've known him for a long time. He was actually a very nice guy. And you could go there now and take a tour with Frank. Well, the other thing, you. too, you know, I, I think, you know, that people don't realize is that it's not – not even so much that you're putting your own life in danger going to confront a rat or to bring honor to the family. It's a murder rat. You don't, you don't want to, you don't put yourself in a situation where you theoretically you put away the rest of your life on a murder rat because you're avenging some code of honor that doesn't directly affect you. So it's not as casual as it seems in TV and the movies where kill this guy, kill that guy. You're like, Actually, what you do is hire somebody else to kill the guy and then say, I don't know, I, I have nothing to do with this. You know, so the, the whole, you know, gun, you know, trig, happy trigger finger thing is not really uh, not as accurate as, as we like to depict it in our, in our business. Terry, the Pine Barrens, it's probably one of the greatest hour of TVs, if not uh, of TV in TV history, honestly. Uh, tell me where that story came from. I mean, I had a, a nice role in it. Of yeah. course, Michael and, and uh, Christopher and Tony did. Bobby yeah. was in there. But uh-huh. where did that story come from? Tell us what that, that was Tim Van Patten, who was, uh, you know, one of our main directors on the show. Uh, Todd Kessler and I were sitting at, at, in the writer's room alone, just bouncing around stories. And Timmy wandered in one day and sat with us. And he said, what are you guys doing? I said, we're just kicking around story ideas. And Tim said, oh, I had a dream that I thought could be a story, but it's really stupid. I said, well, it can't be any stupider than what we're talking about. What is it? And he, said, well, he said, well, I had a dream that Paul and Christopher like took the guy into the woods and then they got lost. I said, that's fucking great. I said, go, go knock on David's door, go pitch him the story. And she was like, no, no, I, I don't want to do that. And I'm shy. I said, if you don't, I'm going to do it. He says, well, are you do it? So I knock on David's door. I go, you got to hear this story. I said, Timmy, Christopher and Paulie. And this, by this point we were pretty deep into season two. So David went, oh, my God, we got to do that, but there's really no room for it in season two. Let's do that next year. So I said, great. So, Timmy, we're going to do this story. So um, season three came around, and just the way it plotted out, it became, I guess, the 11th episode maybe or the ninth episode, whatever, somewhere deep in the year. I think maybe the 11th episode. And uh, I, I ended up writing it, and, uh, and then we – you know, as you know, it's funny, people – don't realize, you know, they think, oh, oh they hired Steve Buscemi because it was like uh, Fargo, and that had nothing to do with it. First of all, it was written to take place in the fall. We didn't, I never envisioned snow involved in this. And, and we hire our directors in TV well, well in advance of what we're shooting. You have the schedule that's done, you know, nine months in advance, and you slot people in. So all we knew was that episode 11, whatever that ended up being, Steve Buscemi was going to direct it. And just sheer coincidence, episode 11 ended up being Pine Barrens. And that's how I met Steve. Uh, and I've been a huge fan of his as an actor. And, you know, also Lester so as a director. And that's how we met and became friends. And uh, the last thing we said to each other when we scouted the locations, and I think it was December 1999, we found our locations up in Harriman State Park. And we said, all right, great. As long as it doesn't snow, we'll be fine. And then we went away for the holiday break and came back and there was a blizzard of epic proportions. And if you remember, Michael, I think the first day in the woods, as you guys were marching 
Valery, the Russian soldier, out into it was just the last snowflakes of that blizzard were falling. He's right. catching some on his tongue, and that was that. That snow had been going on for weeks. But I did a quick rewrite to accommodate now the fact that they're in the snow, and and David was like, "Well, this isn't going to work. They're just following their footsteps." And I I assured David I could get lost with a cr- trail of breadcrumbs. I could, literally, if you took me a block away from my house and spun me around, I'd have to call my wife to come get me. I have the worst sense of direction. And let's assume Paulie and Christopher do too. I said, nobody's going to question this. And I don't think anybody did, but that was, uh, that's how that whole thing came about. Wow. It's, uh, it, uh, do you remember when Sirico uh, sent the PA back to get his pillows? <laughs> actually, actually in, in, in fairness, Sirico said yeah, he can't sleep because the pillow in the ho- hotel is too thick. And I said, I didn't want to say anything about minus two. Can you get me one too? And then Steve was he's like, actually minus two. So the PA had to go to a bed, bath and beyond and get us three really thin pillows. So I'm right there with him. I was like, Oh, I forgot to bring my special pillow and my teddy bear. And, and, uh, Terry, uh, Everybody always asks you everywhere what happened to the Russian. Didn't you put the Russian in somewhere or was going to put him in the we deli or something? About, no, we talked about what's funny. I, I, I always have a, a thing on TV shows where a character, a, a character you've never seen before appears in an episode and, and has huge prominence, but you've never heard or seen of this guy before or since. So Knowing we were going to do Pine Barrens, I said to David, can we get this actor and just pop him into an episode, one or two episodes early when they go to see Valerie, his, uh, I'm sorry, when they go to see Valerie's boss, Slava, we just have this guy give him a line of dialogue. So when you see him again in episode 11, you go, oh, that's the guy who was sweeping the floor. So that's what we did. And then we're like, okay, great. So that made me feel good. We, we at least established him. He didn't come out of thin air. And no, oh, he's Slada's best friend. So you already met the guy. Then afterwards, I, you know, I kept pitching because people were freaking out. What happened? What happened? I had pitched David on the idea of like two years later, Christopher goes to see Slava and he walks in and the guy is, is sweeping the floor again. And Christopher, they meet eyes. And Christopher's like, holy shit, he knows me. And then the guy, and the, Valerie, the Russian guy, turns around and half the back of his head is gone. He's like clearly brain damaged. He doesn't remember anything. And Christopher is like, oh my God. And it's like the guy, his guy's completely a vegetable who's just, you know, he just sweeps the floor. But he keeps looking at Christopher like, I know, I just can't communicate. And David was on board with it, uh, or so I thought. And I think I made a fatal error. I said, oh man, the audience is going to love this. And he went, well, that's the worst reason in the world to do it. <laughs> goes, Fuck that's not, not a good. No. That was the and I was like, so I think the, the consolation was uh, there was a line of dialogue at the bottom of Bing where like, ah, you know, Boy Scouts probably found him or something or he got eaten by squirrels or whatever. Who gives a shit anyway? Just a just a little too long for that. <laughs> so. Really good. Wow. Terry, promise us that you'll come back again because we got so much more Let, to talk what about. What are you guys doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we got so much to talk about, and where I mean, we have this is uh, what was it, episode five, season two. I mean, we got a long haul. So, I yeah. I would come back anytime you guys want. I love both of you. Uh, that time on the show, whatever I do in my career, ha- have done since, and whatever I will do moving forward will always pale in comparison to that magic time we had working together. That was the greatest period night not not just because the show is successful uh it, it was just a pleasure going to work every day in every possible way the crew the cast the other writers the fact that we were doing something so fun i mean when you think about how many laughs we had on that set uh how many, just, how uh, many parties how many parties and yeah, the, christmas you know, party rap parties i mean you know, we were out and about you know yeah and you know you, you people say they throw it around we were a big happy family I, that's about as close to a big happy family as i've ever been involved with i you know i think boardwalk empire was pretty similar too but that was you know me and tim really replicated what we had on the sopranos but that was just you know uh, such a magic time and uh, it, it never to be repeated certainly uh, not in my life, but thank you guys. And uh, this I is really agree, fun. Uh, great seeing you both. And uh, yeah, Same. anytime. If you ever have any uh, any questions you need answered, uh, shoot Absolutely. me. Absolutely. I'll be in All touch. All right, brother. Thanks, Thanks for coming guys. on today. Thanks again.
Really? Thank you, Terry. Wow, that was fantastic. Terrence Winter. Great. Great writer. Great. We got to have him back. I did so much more. I didn't even yeah, get to I'll have him back. I know. All, all I got to was the Pine Barrens. I got more to say. But it's, it's a good lesson for people, who, you know, who want to know how writers get started in Hollywood. Because no, because people ask those questions all the time. And look at that. Look at how far this guy went. Look at look at the sacrifice. And that's what it takes. And listen, he was like a dog with a bone. He, he wasn't letting yeah, go. I mean, obviously, he's talented, but he also worked that talent. You know, everyone thinks they can write. And my family's a sitcom. Oh, I got a great story, you know. I mean, this guy did it. He came from nothing. You know, this the Grady yeah. is, uh, you know, Grady High School is right next to uh, Lincoln in Brooklyn. And that's what it is, auto mechanics. It's like guys right. that, you know, academic-wise. Uh, and look what he did. He goes out there not knowing a soul, took a leap of faith. So there you have it. Hang on a second. There's my boy. You never met Willie. You don't like dogs, Willie. I'll say. Are you a dog I guy? Love dog. I, I, I love dogs, but I'm allergic to them. So yeah. That's the problem. Look, I love and, animals. And he's also, look what he's wearing. Hold on. Can Hold I, on. I want to get one of those T-shirts. Where do I get that? Willie is one year old. See his shirt? Talking Sopranos. So yeah, I want to get one of those. All that's right, I'll get you one. I'll get you yeah. one on the back. What size are you? A little bigger than Willie. You're a little bigger. I and so, uh, yeah. here's my boy. He's... Just turned one years old. Say hello to Uncle Michael. Hi, Willie. How are you? Say hello to Uncle Michael. Say he hello. loves you. Look yeah. at that. He loves yeah, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. Say hello. Look, he's looking at you, Mike. Say hello. Hi, Willie. How are you? So you, so you like dogs? But I'm allergic to them. It's horrible. I wasn't yeah. when I was a kid. I had a dog. My grandmother had a dog. My grandparents, they lived downstairs. We lived upstairs. They had a dog that I grew up with. And then uh, as I got older, I got allergic. I can't have one. I love them, though. I love all animals. Well, he loves you. I also dug up something. This has nothing to do with the Sopranos at all. But uh, you're a, Sopr uh, a, a Yankee fan. And when I was 11 years old, I, I just found this. I was going through my stuff in the garage. And uh, can you see it? It's Mrs. Babe Ruth's autograph. Mrs. I Babe Ruth. Where did you now? Where did you get that at the stadium? Uh, I went to the stadium uh, to Mickey Mantle Day. Wait, I was there. That Are was you? the first game I went. To. I was three years old, nineteen sixty-nine. Nineteen sixty-nine. I have the pennant. My father has the pennant. June eighth. That day, this June eighth, nineteen sixty-nine. It was the yeah. year after he retired. Yeah. When they retired uh, his number. Wait, you were there. I was there. And I, I was there with my dad. I was three years old. More we, my destiny. Dad has, my dad has the pennant. There you uh, go. From that day, it's worth. It's it's actually worth a lot of money. When I went on, yes, I, I you know uh, spot. What is that called? Center stage on the yeah. Yankee Network. My dad came and he brought the pennant. Wow. You know, for Mickey Mantle Day. He scalped the tickets. We went because my dad. I was his. Can, my dad's can, the player. Can you see this? Yeah, I see it. Mickey Mantle. It's a day to remember. It was, uh, I was 11 years old. My friend's wow. uh, father took a bunch of us. And Mrs. Babe Ruth was there. And you can't see it, but she signed it. Mrs. Babe Ruth. Which is pretty cool, I guess. And, Babe uh, Ruth is buried in uh, where my grandparents are, in Valhalla, Gates of Heaven Cemetery. There's a statue of him with, a, with kids. He's in the uniform with the bat. And there's two little kids. That's his tombstone. It's huge. In Westchester, in and and you know what else? Uh, the lead, the uh, Soprano Home movies where we shot up on that lake. Okay, uh, Soprano Home movies. When we shot that, uh, it was Babe Ruth's house. They used it as a trailer. It was really? on the lake. They said he would go there with showgirls in the winter uh, and uh, a seaplane, an ice plane, whatever you call it, and. Uh, they had pictures of him all in the house. It was all obviously. Wow, remodeled. I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, when we when we when Jim did the Lou Gehrig speech, we all went to Yankee Stadium, and George Steinbrenner invited us into his office, and on the wall was the check that the Yankees paid 
the Red Sox to buy Babe Ruth's contract. Yeah, I don't know. I was there, but I don't know if I saw that. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty wild. That was a good day. That was a good day. And we sat and we sat with him for part of the game with George Steinbrenner. He brought us yeah. up to his box. We sat with him and watched the game. It was amazing. Yeah, he was, was really cool. good. I liked yeah, him a lot. He was really good guy. When I asked him about Seinfeld, I said, "Is that you know you get insulted by all the Seinfeld stuff?" Where I think it was Larry David who did his voice, and he he loved it. He said he loved it. Oh. He couldn't have been nicer to us. Great. Then he, he invited us back to throw out the first pitch, and it was me, Lorraine Brock. I wasn't there. Johnny V, uh, Tony Sirico, Jim, and me. And I was the only guy that didn't bounce it. But that's another story. But uh, it was a great day. You were out of town, I think. And we had all our families, and he gave us his box. George Steinbrenner yeah. gave us his box. He did not come. And he had bartenders, chefs. We brought our family. And... and some of the producers, I think maybe Terry and Eileen Landris, and it was a, a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. All right. Very nice. Terry Winter. Let's get started. This is season two, episode five. Big Girls Don't Cry, which is the first of two episodes named after Four Season songs. What was the other one? The other one was uh, Walk Like a Man, which was in season six, episodes, uh, yeah. Season six, uh, well, that was Walk Like a Man, but, you know, and there's a whole Jersey connection with Frankie Valli, who came on the show. Great. As Ru Great. Rusty Milio. If you have not seen uh, a Frankie, con uh, Frankie Valli Four Seasons, see him. So it's incredible. It's, uh, you'll remember your whole life as you go on, uh, uh, you know, for anyone that's old like me. All right, so uh, the first scene it's directed by Tim Van Patten, written by uh, uh, Terry Winter. Uh, this was Terry's first one that he got uh, credited for writing. I'm sure he wrote on some of the other ones, but this is his first episode, one of, uh, I think, 25. Mm -hmm. Correct. So uh, we're at the, the, the tanning salon. Uh, Christopher and Adriana pull up in a Mercedes. Christopher says, I got to run out and do something. And she says, we're going to lose the money. Christopher walks in. It's a brothel. Right. Again, bad, ex brothel. bad extras. They were too, like, high-fiving, yeah, yeah. way too excited. Yeah, those, those bros, those college kids. But, but it, looked, it looked just, they were bad. And then they're, stand, they're sitting there, and you could see they're waiting for me to pass, and then the cue was, Michael passes, and then you guys get up and go over to the girls. And it's exactly what happened. It was very badly staged, I have to say. Whoever was... I don't know. I don't want to insult the AD, but that stood out as just well. The the the, uh, the extras are probably out of the business by now. Uh, that's a good. I, thing. I, I would imagine. Uh, so so Christopher, you walk through the brothel. We see the girls. We see those guys. Uh, the guy Dominic, who's in charge of the brothel, his wife is already a nasty bastard. Yeah. See Lydia that. Gaston. Lydia Gaston. Plays good actress. His, real, yeah, and Stephen Payne plays Dominic, who. Uh, it's a great character. You know, it's very specific with his, the way he's dressed. He's doing, what is he doing? Model a car. Model plane. He's painting. Model plane. He's painting, which is car, just little car. details that are always so, uh, make everything so interesting. And, you know, it's, he's not just sitting there on the phone or whatever. You know, he's, you know, everything's always very specific on this show. Absolutely. Uh, why, and uh, Chris, Chris is distracted. He's not really, he's doing this half hearted, you know. Uh, He's, his mind obviously is somewhere else. He wants to get this done as soon as possible. He, he's he's kind of half-assing this job, I have to say. Well, that's also what I was, was saying is, you know, the guy buckled under with the, the paintbrush, you know, right. and he's doing coke, the guy, obviously. And then uh, his wife, you could see right off the bat, is, is uh, a pain in the ass. With the, with the, she's calling the shots. She says, business is slow. He gives you a light envelope. And Christopher tells him the whole neighborhood's out there waiting for blowjobs or whatever. <laughs> a great line. Uh, Tony and the crew are having dinner at Artie's. Uh, Artie serves. Uh, Tony says hello to Charmaine, who ignores him. And she's saying it's her third time this week. Yeah. He says, come on, how are we going to turn down a four top? She makes Artie very nervous. You know, she's, she's tough. Yeah. And, and, he's in an uncomfortable position because he can't. What is he going to do? They're also his friends, or Jim, especially Tony is his friend. It's his What's friends, his business. Yes. Absolutely. 
uh, he made quail, uh, right. quail a la buco, and he says it's time. Uh, it's time to uh, uh, you know expand broaden your, your horizons. <laughs> and, and and Tony uh, says, "Listen, you need a good mozzarella maker." You know, he weasels that way in. He goes back. He sees Artie. I want to bring my cousin. Needs a job coming over from Italy, and uh, like these guys do, he says to him, "I've been looking out for you since the third grade." I mean, you never want to owe a mob guy a favor. That's it. You're in. You're Ever. in. You're not getting you know, out. The minute you, the minute you do that. You're in forever, and, and Artie's kind of in. And then he says, either do it or not. He tries very diplomatically to get out of it, either do it or not. And he agrees, and he's going to pay him. So uh, they're talking about, which we'll soon find out, Furio. Actors, Furio coming over. Actor studio, Christopher late yeah. again. But now uh, there's some really good uh, actors in this scene. There's, there's Linda Emond or Emmond, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but she's she won uh, Obie, a Drama Desk Award for uh, Homebody Cobble, the Tony Kushner play. She was in The Resistible Rise of Arturo Uwe with Johnny V, Al Pacino. Uh, Chaz, Chaz Palminteri, uh, great actor. Chaz Palminteri, Steve Buscemi. Billy uh, Crudup. A, a great production that I got John to see. John Goodman, uh, Dominic Chianese. Yeah, it was just fantastic. And she was in that. She's done a lot of... She also played... Uh, Opposite Philip Seymour Hoffman in the revival of Death of a Salesman on Broadway. She played, uh, I guess it's Linda Lohman, the Willie Lohman's wife. She was in She's that really show. good. She's really good. She's, she's the real deal. And then um, the woman who plays Cynthia, uh, her name was Onifeda Lampley. She passed away really young at like 49. She was a, a, a playwright as well as an actress, but an award-winning playwright got breast cancer very young and wrote uh, uh, at least one, maybe two plays about her struggle with cancer and performed it go while she was going through chemotherapy and, and performed the plays and dealt with her illness like on stage. And she was, uh, she plays Cynthia in the acting class here and she um, was a real talent and, and sadly we lost her very young. That's too bad. It really is. And writers, uh, listen, like Terry had talked about, writers take acting classes uh, to, to know what actors are going through, to understand it better, helps them in their writing. And Terry had taken acting classes. Uh, well, you were already an actor, but uh, I think kind of sounds like a good idea for a writer to know what an actor is somewhat thinking, the process, yeah. you know, might yeah. help them in their writing. And that's, what this is all about. Sure, right? and for directors too, would be a good idea yeah. to take acting class. Uh, the Soprano Living Room, uh, you see Bacala just on the on the uh, screen on the news. Tony is sitting there with a big jar of mayonnaise, dipping ham in it, uh, which is fantastic, by the way. I've done that. And you're not a are you a mayonnaise guy? That we talk, we talk. No, you're about? not. You're I like mayonnaise. mayonnaise. Oh yeah. But you said Italians don't eat mayonnaise. Well, you? a lot of Italians don't like it, and it's like you know, hands off. But I, I you know, listen, I'm not going to put mayonnaise with salami, but mayonnaise with ham no. and then cheese, like turkey, turkey. You know, sure, tuna. But this is, you know, mayonnaise kind of plays a thing in the Sopranos. Right. When he, who has the mayonnaise on his? That's uh, Paulie Walnuts and uh, right. uh, uh, on the uh, Pine Barrens. The mayonnaise, mayonnaise, he's yelling at him. It really pisses him off. Pisses him off because Paulie's got mayonnaise <laughs> on his mouth. And uh, so Tony's dipping the mayonnaise. I don't even have any lines in this episode. Uh, if you see outside the courthouse, I'm escorting Junior, and it's Butchie the Hat. Is that his name? Guy Butchie from the Mulberry Hat Street? is a, a, a fixture in New York's Little Italy on Mulberry Street. He's been an extra in all the mob movies forever. And he and he lives in, there. If you walk down Mulberry Street, chances are you're going to run into Butchie the Hat. Actually, and he's there with us. The, in la the, the last time I was on Mulberry Street having dinner, I saw Butchie the Hat. I swear to yeah. God. And he's there. Tony uh, starts, uh, he's complaining to the maid well, every time I take a piss. And he thinks it's Carmela. And then he looks over. Oh, and it's, it's his maid. Luke Costello, what's it? Luke Costello Memorial? Luke Costello Memorial. It's a statue in a park in Patterson, New Jersey, where Luke Costello was born. Um, Luke Costello 
died. Actually, I didn't realize he died at 52. He was very young, and he was a really great basketball player. Did you know that? You know, no, he I was a free, free throw champion in Patterson. And in the movie, Here Come the Coeds, he does all these basketball tricks. He does them himself. Oh, really? He was I a did really not good, know that. and he was also a boxer at one that time. That I under knew. The name. Lou King, his name was. Well, he, he died young. You know, I think he, he lost a child. Uh, I think it really? was a son in a pool accident, I believe. Uh, I believe so. And uh, I don't think he was ever the same again, you know, yeah. after that. That took a blow. And I tell you, of all the guys, and I love the Three Stooges. I love the Marx Brothers. I love uh, Laurel and Hardy. Abbott and Costello, to me, Pretty was amazing. the best. Those shorts. Those, yeah. those shorts that you, I used to watch after school when you come home. Yeah, when you come home or Saturday mornings, they were, uh, or Sunday mornings, oh, they were. That was just yeah. so great. Mr. Fields, Mrs. Fields, you know, go see my brother in law, Mr. Fields, uptown. And it was yeah. the same Hilarious. Guy. And Mike the cop and, and, and Stinky played by uh, Joe, uh, Joe Besser, I believe. Uh, played Stinky? Uh, yeah, remember Stinky? It yeah. was, it was a grown man dressed at the, and then he became. Uh, uh, I think he became a, a, a three stooge after a while, after Curly, I believe, if I'm not really, mistaken. yeah. So, for uh, the, Tony meets Paulie, he tells him, I'm stepping back. Uh, Paulie and Silvio is gonna get bumped up. Uh, Pussy's gonna answer to them. Furio, who's coming over from Italy, he's gonna answer to them. It's gonna free Tony up. Obviously, Tony's trying to insulate himself. And uh, and he, obviously he doesn't trust this pussy anymore. No, I think that's been established at the barbecue. Yeah, of course, and, uh, that's been established. You know, uh, this is a great scene coming up there in uh, Elliot uh, uh, Kupferberg's office. Uh, Peter Bogdanovich. She's explaining she had a dream about Tony having a panic attack. Uh, She's and they deal explain. with the Wizard of Oz, music from the Wizard of Oz. And what's ironic here is Peter Bogdanovich talking about movies. And that's a little bit of, a, I think, a little ironic twist there, having Peter Bogdanovich dissecting what movies mean in the subconscious. It's pretty cool. She's trying to explain, you know, what, what happened here. Uh, she says she's gaining weight. Uh, and... Uh, does Tony give her a thrill like a roller coaster, you know, treating Tony? Does it uh, like a horror movie, a roller coaster? Does that give her a thrill uh, with this mobster? She's uh, upset. She calls him a smug cocksucker. She runs out, you know, uh, you think this is funny, and she storms out like Tony. Yeah. He's like Tony does to her. He's hitting a nerve, obviously. You know. And the gaining of the weight, is that something to do with Tony? Um, maybe, you know, I mean, maybe she's, she's not dealing with how, how she really feels about this guy. Like he's saying, it's a vicarious thrill. She's saying it's vicarious. I had to go on the lamb, you know, so what, you know, she's attracted, she, you know, emotionally, maybe sexually, obviously. So she's, she's calling her on it and she doesn't want to deal with it. So maybe she's compensating. Soprano kitchen, uh, the phone rings. Tony looks at Carmela. Carmela's always doing something. She never cooking, just sits down. She's cooking, cooking very often. Cleaning. Uh, yeah, laundry. Cleaning, preparing. I mean, yeah. does she just sit down and take it easy? She's the ultimate. She's busy. She's perfect housewife, you know. She keeps uh, it all together, man. That house wouldn't run without her. She, uh, Tony picks up the phone. The phone rings. He looks at Carmela, to, like, for her to pick it up. I'll give her the message. Tony goes off. The bitch, she's trying to take a loan out of my mother's house. Uh, and he just fucking goes off. As he should in this moment, I think. Because it's really kind of... It's just every time. Uh, it's it's yeah. just building and building and building. She's, but she's scamming I like left what, and right. I like when Carmela goes, who, Pavati? Her name is Janice. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> fucking Pavati. That, that would drive me crazy. Uh, he puts the phone out of the wall. Uh, AJ's watching the whole thing. He looks scared. And she says, why don't you grow up? You know, before cell phones and call waiting, you know, your phone would just ring and ring and ring. And I remember more than once, my father would try to be calling the house. He had been out, whether it be for whatever reason, he needed to talk to my mother. She would be on the phone constantly. Busy, busy, busy. More than once he came home and ripped the phone out of the wall. Yeah. 
more than once. It's like, I mean, you're only hurting yourself, but it's so frustrating. Busy, 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 busy. And also, the, the name of this episode, Big Girls Don't Cry, Carmela says to Tony, why don't you grow up? But there's recurring themes in this episode about being, you know, remaining a child when you should be an adult, especially with Melfi and stuff. And we'll see oh, that for sure. Later. I yeah. been, you know, and Melfi, don't we see her crying in this scene? Yes. We see yes. her crying. Uh, uh, AJ, you know, Tony stops. But Tony's a little embarrassed by what he did. His son saw it, tries to make a joke out of it. AJ doesn't pay attention. He's just not having yeah. it. Tony's there like with... It's a bad dad joke. Very bad. And, and <laughs> AJ just... But AJ's scared. I think all this stuff has, affects him, which we see down the road. Well, that's, it, you know, guess. that's a lot of rage. And, and, and Tony Soprano's intimidating when he's, when he's not angry. When he is angry, it's very scary. And then, you know, he also knows this guy's a mafia guy. You know, it's like... Yeah, yeah. Is that, is, does that rage... Does that, is that the same rage he uses to kill people you know i'm, I'm sure, sure that's, that's going through his head of uh the livia house tony rushes out over there he's banging on the door an incredible look on his face when richie april opens the door it's yeah. just so good in he's his in underwear his underwear. <laughs> tony looks down right he looks in his down. mother's house yeah he's looking for janice to talk to her about this uh richie offers to make him eggs uh <laughs> they get into it as always. Uh, he says, "There's better looking guys in the can than my sister." But Richie yeah. says, "I've been thinking about her." Uh, ten years. You've been thinking about Janice. It's ten and, years. And then, then Richie comes over, you know, uh, with the fork, and he, he mentions blowjobs on my mother's couch, referring. You know, he's got a thing with Janice with well blowjobs. Later on, it was uh, blowing roadies. He, he right. tells Bacala blowing roadies then he the said big sausage fight. in the mouth. But then in the earlier in season one uh, season two, he mentioned sausage in her sausage mouth. Sausage in the mouth, pork, pork in her mouth. Pork. Right. And then the Monopoly game. And the uh, Monopoly game. The Monopoly game uh, blowing guys under the boardwalk. Under the boardwalk. Schlongs. Schlongs in Janice's mouth. So he must have my I, my theory is he caught he saw her doing this to maybe to Richie in the house at one point and he never let her forget it. I'm sure in high school. Sure. Uh, it's, it's funny. Tony is pissed, you know, and Richie doesn't bat an eyelash. He walks over. Doesn't the back down at all. No, you with the fork in his how hand much being intimidating too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see how much smaller he is. He is yeah. much smaller than Tony. and Much smaller, he doesn't fork. care. He's intimidating. He's not afraid at all. And he says, a regular Ozzy and Harriet. For you younger people, that was a longtime TV show with a, about a family, Ozzy and Harriet Nelson. And Now, and, now, do you know Johnny V's family bought Ozzy Nelson's house, and they lived there in Teaneck? Wow. I didn't know that at all. That is uh, true. So that's what that's a reference to, since it's your problem now. Back to the actor's studio. Uh, Christopher improvs a scene about a woman getting a traffic ticket. Traffic ticket. And that actor, uh, a really good actor, Ajay Naidu, who was in the movie Office Space. He's famous for that movie, Requiem from a Dream. He's also a writer and director. And a good guy, a really good guy. Yeah. Chris uh, improvs a funny line, the whole class and the teacher laughs. And Chris is really proud. Yeah, Christopher was really proud after uh, after that. You know, he was funny yeah, line. it meant and a lot to him. Yes, it meant a lot that. to him to get that reaction, to have some success. Uh, he gets assigned the Glass Menagerie, which is written by Tennessee Williams. And in season one, we had that episode, uh, The Legend of Tennessee Moltisante. And Andrea refers to him as Tennessee William. So there's that connection. All right. So we, we, go to, we haven't done this in a while. I think you could see it, the Wingo Meter. You know, I went on Amazon and tried to buy a Wingo Meter. They're all out because of the pandemic. I guess the pandemic, so. <laughs> the pandemic and all the stuff that's going on. They're, ho they're uh, hoarding it. People are this, hoarding the wing meters This is from season one, episode uh, 13, right? Okay. Look at it. You see that? Look yeah. Okay. Now, you got that one. Now, this is from season uh, two, episode five. Right. And he is full-blown wings, man. They're going to the back of his head. This is incredible. He stepped up his wing game in season yeah. two. Yeah. 
See, this, this was little wings, maybe two, three inches. These are full seven to eight inch wings right here. Wow. And this Do they is, get bigger than that, or is that the biggest they got? I don't know. As don't we know. see as the series goes on, right. maybe right. it becomes one big wing somewhere. I'm not quite sure. So there you go, the wingometer. Uh, <laughs> soprano. <laughs> and you haven't been able to get it. Right I haven't been able to get it. No, it's 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 hard. Can you get me one? I'll see what I can do. Right. I got a guy. You got, you got a wingometer guy? I got a guy. I got a. You know, Not I, a, always... I don't want a no bootleg wingometer. I want a real one. No, yeah, you no. know, I, I always got a guy. Uh, soprano, the house party for Furio, right? Uh, everyone's there. Uh, Pussy, Silvio, uh, Paulie, Artie. I mean, every all families there. They're welcoming them. They're welcoming Furio, uh, played by the great Federico Castelluccio, back to uh, coming to the U.S. And I, this was his first episode, like Terry. This was said. his first yeah. episode. Yes, it doesn't air first, right. but this is the first one. Uh, and uh, here comes everyone's there. They welcome Furio. Uh, Christopher late again. Oh, oh you having did. a party? Guess you didn't get the memo. Would you have read it if I sent it? Probably not. You know, Furio says something about putting breast milk in the baby's eyes. Do you know what that? Did they do I, that to you? Was that in your house? Did they do that? No. 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 I don't I, know what that's for. I'm, I looked it up, but I couldn't really find much. Maybe you, I know for pink eye, they used to do that, but I don't know if that's what he's referring to or just a general, I don't know if it's a superstition to keep the evil eye away. I'm not sure. Really? Pink eye? I never even heard that. Yeah. Really? And does it have to be your mother's breast milk or anybody's breast I milk? I think you'd prefer that. Oh, okay. okay. I just thought maybe... Was that I don't know. Place? A wet nurse. Uh, maybe from a wet nurse you could do it. <laughs> I could go a lot of places with that. I'm going to let it go. Why? Wow. Paul, it's, 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 Paulie uh, says uh, his wife is a Chinese cunt. And Gigi behind him says she's Filipino. <laughs> That's right. Just a throwaway thing. Yeah, uh, uh, Gigi was a politically correct mobster. <laughs> but but you want to you wanna know something? At some point, Tony's just staring. Staring at Furio. And even Carmilla goes, what? Is well, this, he, yeah. He's is figuring out. A, go ahead. Is this a little bit of the beginning of Carmela Furio? She pulls him away at one point. He's working the room. She's introducing him around. Oh, she's probably attracted. I mean, when you're attracted to someone, it's usually from the beginning, right? On a, At least on a physical level. Um, but Tony's staring, I think, for a different reason. Because Tony's figuring out how he can use this guy and what, how, what benefit, you know, Furio is going to, going to be to Tony. And, um, Pussy's very suspicious of him and feels really like he didn't go to Italy or he's not going to, you know, he didn't go to Italy. So he never met this guy before and he feels yeah. really left out and he's very suspicious of him and jealous. And he uses a derogatory term. A zip. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's why I, you know, I remember hearing that. You know, when very, I was... very derogatory. That's from a guy that comes over from Italy. Right. That's a, that's a, not a nice thing to say. Thing. Uh, Tony uh, decides there. He tells Christopher, "Don't worry about the massage parlor." He's in his head, like you said. He's going to get Furio to take care of it. Right. You know, Christopher's apartment. They're rehearsing the scene. Uh, he can't understand the character. Uh, he's rehearsing the glass menagerie, which is a fantastic play so uh, adrian is explaining the scene to him and the gentleman caller christopher doesn't like it uh and uh <clears throat> christopher does an impression of uh joe pesci in one of his not so famous roles jimmy hollywood i've never seen that movie have you uh maybe a long time ago uh, let me hear you do pesci come on I don't do Pesci. Well, you did Pesci on the show. Lynn. I barely remember that. Come I on, dig it up. I, I don't. That was good. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I don't. Do, I don't do imitations. Uh, I only do Ben Gazzaro, but nobody really knows, you know, how Ben Gazzaro really sounds. Do Ben Gazzaro. They could look it up. Ben Gazzaro. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, someone said to him, "Where are you going to dinner?" I'm going to Le Cirque. If you don't know Le Cirque, you don't want to know Le Cirque. It does they, sound like it. I did a movie with him. They went up to said uh, the wardrobe person said, um, "We got a pair of sandals for you." He goes, 
I don't wear sandals. They remind me of German tourists. They wear them with the white socks. <laughs> Nobody's going to be looking at my feet, honey. If they're looking at my feet, we're all in trouble. And they said, well, okay, well, let, why don't you go into makeup? He said, I don't wear makeup. I have a tan. And then they got, he got on the set uh, and they gave him, he's playing an artist, right? So uh, they give him uh, a new, the New York Times. They said, oh, I'm, he asked for the New York Times. They said, uh, sorry, Mr. Gazzara, we, we didn't clear the New York Times. We don't have the rights to use them in the movie. He goes, I've been reading the New York Times and pictures for 35 years. Give me the New York Times. And they give him the business section. He goes, business? Why you give me the business section? I'm an artist. Give me the art section. And then he looked at me. He goes, you got to break their balls a little bit. <laughs> and you like Ben Gazzara very oh, much. I love him. I love him to death. He was fantastic. Great actor. I mean, one of the one of my all time favorite actors. Maybe maybe my favorite. I don't know. Yeah, I met him. I think I met him one 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 night. Maybe I was with you one night. Uh, yeah, uh, we honored him uh, the first uh, benefit we had for the theater. Him and Seymour Cassell. Ben Gazzara is in Killing of a Chinese Bookie, Husbands, Roadhouse, Roadhouse. He's good. <laughs> Anatomy of a Murder, Otto Preminger picture with Jimmy Stewart. He that's I think his first big movie. Um, I told you I liked him in Convicts Four from Convicts when I was Four. a kid. From when I was a kid, yeah, terrific actor. That was a good impression. I'm very impressed by that. You know, you know what I like about Adriana? I got to tell you, she's all in on. She really wants to help. Christopher. Very supportive. She loves very him. Very much. Wants, so. She wants to have a life with the future. Yeah, she's, without she's, a doubt. She's, you know, very nice. Got a big heart here. He goes to Hesh's house. Tony. Hesh is there. You know, he's kind of, he was busy, whatever he was doing. He had his girl there. And uh, he's confiding in Hesh like Hesh is a shrink. He's no longer seeing Melfi. So he's going to Hesh's house and he's, says, I, he confides in him. I've been seeing a shrink. Hesh says, I have also. And uh, I had an inkling. <laughs> he said, yeah. I had an inkling. Tony wants to know why he's, uh, uh, why he has a bad temper. And, and and Hesh explains that his father also had panic attacks. Yeah, his father had the same thing, which is a big deal for Tony to learn that it was inherited genetic, and that um, you know that's one reason. I think it's in some ways it's a bit of a relief because oh sure okay, but it's also a little scary. But well, Hesh, Hesh kind of checked a little bit here too, and starts talking about a colonoscopy and an MRI, and he's just. They're having two different conversations. Two different conversations. He's, they're shoving a camera up your ass. And the Hesh thing, is bored. It, it's too completely <laughs> – you don't want to be bothered, Hesh. It's too completely he different. It. I guess Tony feels because he's older, he's not in his immediate crew. You know, he's a, Hesh is a smart guy and was always a good, you know, advisor to his father, so he feels like he could trust him. And Absolutely. Uh, we're back to the actor's studio. Christopher doesn't want to do the glass menagerie. He wants – uh, to change scenes. They give him Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, she says, I don't want to see a James Dean impression. Yeah. Now, do you do James Dean? Well, Christopher does him in the scene, in the next scene. But, uh, I mean, James Dean was, I mean, uh, he only did three movies, right? He did Rebel Without a Cause was his first, and he did Giant and East of Eden. East of Eden, directed by Ilya Kazan, who did Streetcar and On the Waterfront. But, um in those three movies made such a huge impact on the world and on movies and, and just as an icon and a phenomenal actor died at 24 years old. I know, but there are people that say if he didn't die, he would not have been as famous. There are people out oh, there that no, say he was overrated. I, I'm just saying. Who said that? Saying but the same people that said the, the whole show was the dream, those pundits and wags and all those guys. Those you people, see? we got to get them on. As I want anybody who said James Dean is overrated is, is an asshole and a douche. Okay, listen, that's from me. I'm just a messenger. I'm just James messenger. Dean was fucking phenomenal. I mean, he act. He was like Marlon Brando. I mean, he was. But so there are people saying on, that because he died and the way he died, that brought about his. You know, his fame became. E Tenfold. Well, it did become tenfold, but it's not, it's no, no judgment on his acting. His acting was revolutionary. He was so honest and so vulnerable and believable. And 
you know, he was very physical. Like he, his, his body, you know, he had, he acted with his whole body and was stuff. I've never really seen many people act like that. It's almost uncanny. I mean, so you want to have him on, you want to have one of these, I want one of these naysayers. Yeah. Is it, is one of these naysayers. I have a feeling I know who one of these people are, but we're going to get, we're going to get them. We'll talk about that. All another. right. So we'll, we'll get them. We'll get James him. Dean was the fucking shit. Get out of We're going to get him. We're going to, we're going to, well, we're going to take care of all business on this show. Our teacher, uh, John D'Amelia and Sharon Andrew, and my teacher, Elaine Aiken, was friends with James Dean and was in Lee Strasberg's class with him because James Dean studied at the Actors Studio and Elaine was there at the same time he was and knew him and was blown away by his work. And, and everybody was when they saw him. I guess he worked at the Actors Studio and people saw him and just, you know, he just had a, an honesty and a sense of truth that you didn't really see much in film acting back then. It was very, you know, film acting evolved a lot after like Brando and James Dean and Monty Clift and people and people like that. And, and like Geraldine Page, you know, these people who brought an incredible naturalism and, and honesty to their work. But All right, we're going to we're going to no. take care of everyone. Before the 86 episodes are up. Oh, we, oh, they we got gonna, a lot of people to straighten We got out. some scores to settle. Oh, right. yeah, and we will. Uh the Stugat spoke. Uh Irene is feeding the ducks. We know Tony has a, a love for ducks. He she's feeding them cheese doodles. He tells her to stop Pirate's booty, actually. Those natural cheese doodles or something. That's what it was. Is that better? Pirate's booty has know. popcorn also, right? But Don't they're they? not as tasty as cheese doodles. The real down they're and dirty. The, the real down and dirty cheese doodles. Yeah. Uh, one of the, 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 the guy from the next photo, Russian guy, uh, why don't you mind your own business? Uh, his outfit is priceless. The clothes, he's wearing orange and yellow, and it's just... I don't think that was a costume. I think he... He, he that, brought that? He that came right from Brighton Beach, man. That's a good choice. Uh, he's telling Irene, to, you know, uh, you know, why don't you go with a real guy, his brother, you know, uh, go, with a, go with a Russian guy. And Tony goes over. He snaps because he's not taking his medicine. He's not seeing Melfi. Every little thing bothers him, a la the phone, and, and, and uh, he rips it out of the wall. And he grabs the guy by the balls. His wife is screaming. <laughs> Now, and, have you did you ever see somebody do that in real life? Like a tough guy grab another guy by the no. ball? That's a pretty extreme move, right? And the guy didn't try to punch him in the head or anything. The guy just took it. I mean, if someone grabbed my balls, I guess you got to try to do I something. The lady was, she was screaming like a lunatic. But uh, Irina tells him, look, you always got to ruin everything. Because obviously now he's got to pack up and go. They were going to have a nice day out on the boat. And all that is ruined because of Tony's temper. Uh, Christopher's apartment, uh, they're rehearsing the scene from Rebel Without a Cause. And she laughs a little. And, and Christopher's Chris getting emotional, yeah. You know, fuck this shit, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he gets mad at her. And like I said, she's really, really uh, helping him out here. You know, she's really in his corner. You yeah. know, that's, that's what you want. She's got his back. Hesh's house, it's late at night. Tony woke him up. <laughs> Tony's uh, waking him up in the middle of the night to blab about his personal problems and his, you know, and Hesh is completely checked out. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, uh, he calls him, you know, Tony's getting a little rambunctious. He says, easy, lady buck. Laddie easy, buck. Buck. Laddie Laddie buck. buck. It's a naughty boy. You know, that means yeah. a naughty boy. What does Tony say? Having... I have an aversion to my... Swimming pool. I mean, he's talking shit. And just, it's two you know. different conversations once yeah. again. Allah, when they saw them earlier, uh, Hesh talks about a guy at work. I'm not a tough guy, but I wanted to murder the guy. He's talking about the, the, the guy was talking about Germany. And it's two different conversations. I noticed the clock is 1.38, 1.40 a.m. Really? Yeah, wow. L later on, you're going to see that again. Oh, uh, all right. I like it. Uh, okay. Uh, the actors, uh, we're back in the acting class. Uh, Jay Naidu is doing a scene from Buried Child, monologue from Sam Shepard's Buried Child, straight back as, as far as they could take me. Then it all dissolved. Everything dissolved. That's from uh, Did you Child. know that, or did you have to look that up? I knew it. Uh, I know that play. Yeah, Buried Child. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, I've seen it a couple of times, and I think... 
uh, I think Johnny Ventimiglia used to work on that in acting class, a scene from that for some reason that's in my head. But I've seen it, a couple of productions of that play. It's very good. Um, now, uh, uh, so Chris does the scene. He's fantastic. The teacher loves him. The scene is from, that, that's a scene in Rebel Without a Cause at the Griffith Park in L.A. at the observatory, the planetarium there. And it's Sal Mineo plays his friend who gets killed. One of my, I love him. One of was my there another The guy from the Bronx, another fantastic Di guy. Died, died so young. Died such, young. Such a horrible death. In Natalie Wood plays the girlfriend. And uh, Jim Backus plays his father. Mr. Ho Mr. Mr. Howell. Howell. And Mr. Magoo. Yes. The voice of Mr. Magoo. He also was in Mad, Mad, Mad World. He was really good. He, was, a, he was great in that. He played a great, weak father. Yeah. He played a great role, Jim Backus. And Christopher, you know, every, I love it. Unfreaking believable, the teacher says. I mean, it, it's, he does just an incredible scene here. And, of course, there's always an idiot. How do you make yourself cry like that? I mean, that, that and Christopher's embarrassed because he, he was vulnerable in front of a group of people, and he's getting emotional because of his own relationship or lack of relationship with his father who died when Christopher was very young. Uh, they're in Artie Bucco's restaurant. Furio's making the mozzarella. Now, you know, to make a good mozzarella, you have to be able to... The guy who makes the best mozzarella usually is the guy who can keep his hands in really hot water for the longest amount of time. Because to make a good mozzarella, you have, to, you have to work with the cheese in very, very, very hot water. And you have to work with it to make it so it doesn't... Otherwise, it gets really tough. Yes. It's nothing worse than tough mozzarella. Nothing worse. Right? That's, all, that, that, that's uh, Popa Greenwich Village. That's, uh, Is it? I didn't even know that. Sure. Popa Greenwich Village. He, he insults the cheese guy. Really? Your family's mozzarella. Yeah. He insults the, uh, Eric Roberts' character. He, I haven't he, seen that in so long. That's a great a movie. movie. Oh. He insults the cheese guy. Uh, Burt Young's eating Galama. He says, I'm eating bland. I got a bad stomach. Mm. A great, great... Uh, a shot in Little Italy, a lot of it. Furio's got a cigarette coming out of his mouth. The ashes are dangling. Charmaine's not happy. She don't even, you know, she's ha not happy that he's there to begin with, no. but especially that he's smoking now, you know. Uh, the outside is Pauly and Pussy. Uh, Pussy's asked to leave the table. Pussy's insults Furio. Furio goes out front. He's calling him Furio. Furio, Furio, Furio. yeah. And uh, did you st did you stomp the wine yourself? Right. Pussy's insulting to Furio. You know? And why does Pussy have to leave but not Furio? Because they're both up and under Silvio and Paulie, right? Furio answers Silvio and Paulie, so does Pussy now. And they dismiss Pussy and they let uh, Furio stay. Listen, they are leery of Pussy. I mean, it happened at the barbecue. We saw it. It was episode 12 or 13 when they had the barbecue. Tony stares at Pussy. He knows he's the rat deep down in his soul. He knows. He's letting it go. Elliot's office. Great scene. She's thinking about taking it. Well, first we go to the, uh, the place with Skip, though, Pussy. Oh. Uh, and uh, Pussy says, if anyone was ever desperate for a nickname, it's Furio. That's a great line. Great, great, great line. They're both complaining. Shop talk. Well, it also Skip is working them. You know, he's that's part of working the guy. Hey, we're in the same boat. I'm just like you. That's a whole. That's an interrogation technique as well. Yeah, that's but I also think guy. Skip is legitimately maybe. Is, yeah, maybe. But it's also a technique. Said, you know, when you when they when you interrogate a guy, say a guy who beat his wife, you say, you know, my wife, she's busting my balls. I understand why you could do something like that. Did you hit her? Did you punch her in the head? You know, you try to get on the same level to get gotcha. to him over. You know, that's what he's doing. Yeah, but I think he's also upset. He's talking about the Samoan guy. Uh, came, you know, three years out. He's now the boss. So they're kind of, it's a little bit of a shop. Commiserating there. together, right? And, and he's telling the pussy doesn't, uh, that Tony doesn't care about him. You know, I've always told you, Tony doesn't care about you. And uh, it's a good scene, but that's a great line. If anyone is Let's have a desperate for a nickname. Yeah. Now, now we're in uh, Elliot's office, Cup of Bird, and she's thinking about taking her client back, she says. Uh, Melfi is crying. Is that could be hence the big girls don't cry? Yeah, she says acting out, acting out like a child. That's what he does to me. 
And that's another thing about is Tony, you know, the, we speak about this a lot on the, sh uh, you know, dealing with the show, Tony spreading this toxicity to people around him. You know what I mean? And now it's spreading to Melfi and she's behaving like a child and she's acting out. Um, and she's saying it's therapeutic for me to deal with Tony. And he calls her and says, it's not supposed to be therapeutic for you. He's the one who's in therapy. This is your therapy with me here, not with Tony Soprano. But he also says that you have sexual feelings for him. She really hesitates there. Yeah, she obviously does. And she says, oh, he's a little boy. I have personal feelings for him. Personal feelings. She's a little boy, but, but there's a big hesitation before she says no. Right. Now, this is a great scene. This was Federico Castellucio's first scene, as Terry said. Uh, it was late at night. Uh, I think he had one take. It was done on one take. The, from, the, from, from, the, from the beginning, when he goes in, that, to the, when he gets in the office, is one, un, is one take. Once he's in the office, there's a cut, and then they, they shot it a couple of different ways. But from the moment he goes in that whorehouse to the moment he gets in the office in the back, it's all one take from behind from behind Fury on the camera. It's great. It's great. It's, great. it's a it great, is. great scene. It's a precision. It's like a dance. It's like a choreographed yeah, dance. Very, uh, very good. Tony is explaining to Furio what needs to be done. Who, you think who, it's odd what's that Tony's what? there? What's that? It's odd that Tony's there. Well, I think it is, but Tony gets off on it. Yeah. I think it very much is. And we, we see that later on when he talks to Melfi. But uh, he comes in, he, right off the bat, he's, punching this one, hitting that one, punches the wife, shoots the guy, gets the money. I mean, this was uh, Federico's first day of shooting, as Terry said. Yeah. and Very skillful. Absolutely. And uh, the wife, I'm sure the, the whole audience wants the wife, the way she's screaming, wants the wife. You know, she's a pain in the ass. Uh, it's brutal. It's vicious and brutal, and it's and it's – very much like what we saw in Italy when he punched that kid's Absolutely. mother in the face. And this, he's is, why, not Furio this is why is, Tony brought him. This is why he's there. Yeah. Uh, 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 Furio is not fucking around. Tony is getting great pleasure in listening to this. Yeah. The gun go off, the screams, he's getting great pleasure in this. And I find it very odd that he's there because he just finished telling Paulie how he wants to insulate, but yet he's outside of this place. Right. He wanted yeah. to be there, man. Yeah, and he got what he—he's getting what he wanted from him. Uh, the actors' class, they're doing the exercise. That's Christmas. called the repeat exercise, and it's—you know—I went to Lee Strasberg, like Johnny Ventimiglia, and and uh, the repeat exercise was a Sanford Meisner, who was a different school of acting, but very uh, called the Neighborhood Playhouse. Robert Duvall, I think, studied with Sanford Meisner. That repeat exercise is very specific to the Meisner technique of acting. And you just repeat the same words and try to create some kind of reality and, and, and you know, a back and forth between the other actor. And that's what they're doing there. And it's, I didn't really do that uh, in my acting class, but a lot of people have done, you know, that is a common technique, uh, exercise for technique, yeah. His fe uh, feelings about Christopher's father comes up, obviously, and uh, uh, he... Uh, he punches uh, Mitch, his partner. He punches, he kicks him. I mean, uh, immediately, Christopher is pissed off. And, and Mitch is, a, besides that, I know that that's not why he hit him, but Mitch is very pretentious. He's, you know, stretching yeah. his neck and taking yeah. deep breaths. I mean, he's an ass wipe He's actor. a Porsche dealer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, uh, uh, which we've spoken about before, but... There's some, a lot of pretense. A lot of guys are faking it. You know, I remember early on going to auditions and guys are faking it and, and, and you know, say, acting all actory and saying all the words. It's like, just fucking go in there and do it. You don't have to talk about it. You don't have to be pretentious about it. Do your work. Do your preparation and go and do it. Let's stop all the bullshit. You know, and I remember playing basketball as a kid and in college, the new sneakers and the sweatbands and the, they had all the great equipment and I had these fucking, you know, shitty sneakers and torn of shit and I would just beat their ass. They had all the fucking trappings, all the props. And I find not all actors, of course, a lot of actors have that nonsense. A lot of and bad ones. You, 
You know, there's a lot of that going on. And, and then when you're in the audition room, in the waiting room, they're talking up and they're talking to each other. And I just work with this one and that one. And they, they commiserate like, you know, they want everyone to hear. A lot of it's there's a lot of bullshit going on. Yeah. Well, those are usual. Usually people who don't work that much. Are, are no, not that exactly. Good. But uh, there's a, a lot, lot of, of that. smoke. Smoke screen. There's a lot of that. But back to Christopher's apartment, Adriana's putting ice on Christopher's toe. And she says, maybe that scene brought some stuff up about your father. Maybe it reminds you yeah. of your father. Nasty. He's a nasty to a nasty line that he throws it. How do you know what it's all about from writing down orders at the restaurant? Really nasty. You know, he's, she's feeling uh, vulnerable. He's, you know, emotional and he doesn't know, he doesn't know how to deal with it, obviously. And he's spilling it out on her cause she's pointing it out to him, but it's a nasty thing. And he, he regrets it immediately. Obviously he knows it was out of line because he does love her and he, he, he doesn't want, I her. mean, she's, she's really all for him really wants to help him. And, and, you know, I've seen you get nasty. You get a little nasty, Christopher. You've insulted me. Sometimes. Michael, me, yeah, or Michael. Christopher, I've insulted you. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Take it easy. Uh, I'm fucking around with yeah, you. Yeah, I know. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> you never get nasty. You're always... No. You're always... I, uh, I'm like a, a breath of fresh air. A breath of fresh air. That's I, what we I, used I'm, to call I'm, you on the set. Breath of fresh I'm air. a blossoming... I'm like a blossom tulip. That's what I am. A breath we got to get those wogs and pundits on the show. We got to get them. So, we want to... We're going to... And I'm just going to be... Firing squad. I'm going to be an observer because I want to see you go all Christopher. Oh, yeah. You're going to just be an observer. I'm you're sure. you're right. going to go Christopher on it. I'm going to go That's off on it. Right. Uh, we're at Murphy's office, and Tony tells her, I found out a little history. My father had panic attacks. First, they're kind of dancing a little, right? She's very happy to see him. Yeah, but they're dancing. Tony, they're dancing, he's a yeah. little, right? A little dance going on. Uh he asked if she read that article that Hesh had mentioned in the New York Times about an MRI and and uh, a brain scan. See. Yeah, yeah. She says if you want to be a, a a better gang leader, read the Art of War. And he says, "Fuck you, you know, you know." Yeah, and well, she also says, "What do you expect to? Which, why are you coming here? What do you expect to achieve?" And he said, yeah. "Ultimately, he wants total to be in total control of his feelings." and of his anger and of his power you know and um she suggests that he says fuck you you know where i was when when you called me you know and he says what where he was where he was sitting outside while a guy was in there beating you know shooting he tells stuff. her that yeah. which, which is unusual because uh she could be subpoenaed yeah. you know if that ever came out and uh uh and she says to him uh he says uh how do, he said, how does, she says, how does it make you feel? And he said, I, I, I wish it was me in there. She wish, uh, yeah, he wishes he, it was him in the tanning salon, the slash brothel. And she says, giving a beating or taking one. Yeah. Giving or taking. And he doesn't answer. You know, and late at night, Christopher's apartment, he's thinking, He's, he's in bed, and his clock is 1.38 a.m. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. So it's either means something or the prop guy didn't bother changing the fucking clock. They use the same clock. Maybe the latter. <laughs> Christopher throws out his uh, his writing. He's He said this is all, you know, he feels like, you know, he's... He's moving on. He's going to get rid of this shit. He's not going to write. He's going to be a mobster, basically. And, you know, he feels maybe too vulnerable that this is not for him. Um, and we do know he goes back to it eventually. Uh, but do you but think now, and, and you think it's because of uh, it brought up feelings that they didn't want to feel? Yeah. Yeah. I think he just feels like it's it, it's too much, you know. He'd rather be a monster who doesn't have to deal with his feelings. <laughs> hey, listen, man, you know, uh, I felt that way at times. Just, uh, you know, you got to go places sometimes in a scene that you don't really want to go, you know, in your head. And, uh, you know, I've questioned, like, what the fuck am I doing this for? Why am I making myself feel like shit for? 
or, or, or Tony Soprano slash Jim. I remember him saying, I mean, Tony was angry all the time. I mean, every day, Yang. Oh, he got angry. really, he got really yeah. angry, especially towards the end when he felt like the writers were taking stuff from his own life, and he was calling them vampires and stuff by by the end, and saying, "You're taking stuff from my life and putting him in." He he got really upset with that. Um, I don't know. I didn't that that stuff doesn't bother me as much as like the business itself, and you know, getting a job, not having a job, you don't get the job and dealing with, you know, that kind of shit. You know, the worst thing your agent could say is after you go, you're up for a part. They loved you. They love you. Okay. Yeah. I read that. Tell them to fuck. But you're not hate getting me. the part. I'd rather. Yeah. They hate me and I don't get the part. Hell, yeah. Hate me and give me the job. But, uh, but that was something for Jim, you know, or anyone, you've got to be angry or, you know, sometimes you watch TV shows and I'm going every week, this fucking girl or guy is crying, crying, crying. I mean, to do that week in and week out, that takes a toll on you. Some people have an easier time than others, but I know sometimes with Jim being angry all the time, he had to get mad and fighting and arguing and, and you know, that, that, that gets to you a little bit, yeah. you know? The song, the the end of the episode here is White Mustang by Daniel uh, Lanois, who's a Canadian, more more known as a producer than a uh, than, than a musician, songwriter. But he produced some of U2's best albums, like uh, Unforgettable Fire and uh, Joshua Tree and Octoon Baby. He also produced for Dylan and Willie Nelson and Neil Young. But that song, I thought, really worked. Very atmospheric. He started out uh, as an engineer, worked on some of Brian Eno's the ambient records, but this kind of is in that vibe a little bit. But it was a, it was a good choice. I liked how really, it really good episode, and really good episode. episode. Yeah. I liked it very much. Uh, you were great in it as always, and uh, I enjoyed it. Really, re really, some really good performances, some funny stuff. This this had a little bit of everything. It had uh, you know what a soprano fan likes, Mob drama, stuff, yeah. Funny mob stuff, you know, shake down a little bit of everything across the board. So, you know. Yeah, it was a fun one for 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 me just doing because uh, I spent a lot of time in acting class, so I know what that's like, and it was it, it very accurate in a way on how acting classes are. And uh, it was fun to do the James Dean scene. That was really fun. I never thought I'd wind up doing that. That was kind of cool. And uh, the um, the actors I got to work with in in those scenes were particularly good. Oni, Oni uh, Lampley and um, uh, Linda and Ajay. That were oh, no, it was really, it was really good. Uh, you know, I, I went to class a few times. I've worked mostly one on one, and I still do. You know, I still, you know, when I get a script on Blue Bloods, I I have someone that you know Joanna Bexin, who's just terrific, uh, and I've been working with her now over 10 years, I worked with another guy during the Soprano years called Richard Scanlon, who was a huge help to me at the beginning. I think Michael uh, Rispoli, we were going to go to that ha uh, Harold Golnick uh, at one point. Harold Guskin? Guskin, yeah. Uh, Jim he was Jim's him, guy, right yeah. And me and Michael, Michael, we I had spoke to him and I had made contact with him. And uh, and then I worked with Richard Scanlon, who was great. And, and, and like I, I think I've said it, sometimes I would actually – rehearse the scene at his apartment and then go to the studio and shoot it. Uh, I, I did his class a few times. I didn't really care for it. I was already on the Sopranos and I kind of felt it was like, well, let's see what you got fat boy. You know, you, you know, who the fuck are you? I, I got that feeling that from who? Not, from the, the people in the class, the other students, really? that's kind of, maybe I wasn't, but that's how I felt. It was like, well, you're supposed to be so good. You know, you're on the Sopranos. They didn't work much or if at all. So I just, at that point, I just thought, and I'd rather, you know, go over the scenes. If I have even an audition now, something that I don't think I could handle, I'll go discuss it, talk, yeah. run the lines, you know. Uh, she'll give me some ideas and work things out, and you know, have it planned in my head. And I, I enjoy one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I don't think I'll ever stop that. I, I enjoyed that. And like I said, dirty little secret. A lot of big people use acting coaches. So, so. Oh, I, w I work my first acting class at Strasbourg, a guy named Charlie Lawton, who was Al Pacino's coach. Al Charlie died maybe 10 years ago, but for, up until he died, he worked with Al on every Absolutely. role. 
He was out. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of something some way. And even though I know this character, uh, you know, she'll say, try this or try that. And you get a little more comfortable, you know. And of course, when you go to the set, not that often, but sometimes the director sees it a different way or the writer. So, you yeah, know. you got to be ready to roll with it. You know, uh, but a great episode. Great episode. I loved your Ben Kazara impression. I'm expecting more every week of different yes, impressions of we'll you. Some. I'll work on them. Okay. The winner of our AMA best question is John from Manchester, UK. And we're sending John a pair of Bose headphones. Now, we, you know, I have to say this. About half the questions we get are from the United Kingdom and Ireland. It's wow. kind of uncanny. The fans over there are really you know, on top of things and, and into the show. It's We've got cool. some great questions so, since we started this. Well, John from Manchester, great music town, Manchester. Smiths are from there. The Stone Roses, lots of great bands. But John asks, if you could choose one actor each to have made a guest appearance, who would it be they could play a character of themselves? So... I mean, I'm not, I mean, Ben Gazzara is a no brainer. And we've been talking about him. I would have loved to, to, for him to be on. Um, one of my all time favorite actors as well is Sidney Poitier. And great actor. Man, he did this movie with Cassavetti, uh, uh, Cassavetti starred in with him called Edge of the City. Cassavetti's actually not that good in the movie. I think it was one of his first movies. He got a way, but I mean, he, John was a great actor, but this movie, Sydney is phenomenal, just incredible. Uh, he's so full of life and plays this character. I just saw the movie recently, so it's in my head, but he plays this character um, so beautifully. Uh, I think he is, you know, just one of the, the best we've ever had. I'd love to have see you, him. have you ever met him? No, never met him. I have not. Have you? No, but, uh, uh, the, you know, Great Night at the Apollo uh, last year, you know, the great charity right, for the, for Jazz, the Jazz Foundation Sundays. that you got me involved in. He was supposed to be there, and I guess he wasn't well or wasn't feeling well that yeah. night, and he, uh, uh, he didn't make it. But uh, uh, that's a great choice. And now who would you choose? You know... Uh, I don't know. You know, I didn't. I didn't really think about it that much. I mean, there's so many great actors. Uh, Who is listen, your favorite I'm a, actor? I'm, I'm a huge Burt Lan I'm a huge Burt Lancaster. Uh, really? Yeah. Just love them. Just love them. In and which movie? I, I loved him in Atlantic City. One of my favorite. Ah. Uh, I just Louis Mal. That's a Louis Mal movie. I okay. just loved them. That was a very underrated movie. Fantastic uh, movie. I I liked him a real lot. I I you know what he does is just. Uh, uh, you know, the Birdman of Alcatraz, of course. And uh, he was in, uh, oh, fuck. The I Swimmer. Just... Did you ever see that movie? It was on last night, but I didn't see it. It was on last night, late on uh, TCM. It was on last Turner night. Classics. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very it's strange. Good. I didn't see that. It's a very strange movie. You know, it's based on a John Updike short story. But, uh, yeah, it's worth seeing. You should check it out. Well, what's the movie? Because I'm uh, Kevin Costner, the baseball movie, the famous baseball movie. Bull Durham? That one? No, 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 no. The Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. He was so great in I've that. I've never seen that. He's, Moonlight he's, Graham. I, oh, he's so great. I didn't know he's in that. Yeah. Oh, he's so great. You know, you know, he's not the star of it, but he's got an incredible role in it and just so warm. I mean, uh, if anybody, I think that would be my choice right there. Good uh, choice. Who would I you like want that. to play you in a movie? Yeah, the Michael Imperioli story. His life story. The King of Mount Vernon. <laughs> Who would play? That's the title. Um, I wouldn't go see that movie. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> okay, but but who would play you? Who would play me? Yeah. Uh, Robert Redford, of course. I mean, that, oh, that's, okay. that's a no-brainer. That's an obvious choice. Um, All right. Who would play you? Uh, it's got to be a fat guy. How many fat actors are there? It doesn't have to be. Christian yeah, Bale, that would be cool. He's he Christian did, Bale, he'll put on the weight. He can put, put on, on the weight. A yeah. buck and a half, 150 pounds would play me. But he's from England, right? Is he from England? Uh, I think Australia. Australia. Uh, I don't like when uh, 
people from England, Australia play Americans. They got to they got to leave us the roles for Americans. They should. But that seems to be okay there. Yeah, I don't like that. But opposite, it's no good. You know. Uh, you know. No, but that we need to. You know, it's hard enough to get jet work. You know, as an well, American. that's why Canada they protect their actors pretty good there. Yeah, we got to we got to do that. We got to stop that. I think. All right. Well, let's have them on, and you could yell at them. Too. Have who? The union. Yeah, whatever, whoever you want to yell at, we're gonna have them on. Immigration, <laughs> homeland security. All right. All right. Thank you very much. That was a good Thanks, question. Thanks, John. Good question. So we want to thanks for listening, and remember, new episodes are released every Monday. So please subscribe, really. It helps us out a lot. Subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. And please subscribe on YouTube. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Producer is Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amaton. You can hear more of Elijah's music by clicking the link on Talking Sopranos. Dot com. Our production crew includes Eric Desi, Bobby Hutch, Frank McKay, Ty Verderam, and Sierra Sharipa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. All right. Thank you to Terry Winter. Couldn't thank you enough. And we got to have Terry back on uh, before we do the rest of these episodes. Yeah. Yeah. We may be Pine Barrens or something. I am. Uh, great episode, man. Yeah. See great impressions next. today. Great. You're like the uh, like Frank Gorshin. Um, uh, yeah, Frank Gorshin used to do James Dean. I saw a clip of him on the Tonight Show. He would turn around, and then he turn. It wasn't even so much the voice, but he would do like the face. He would change his whole face, and he would come out like James Dean. It was very interesting to watch. It was amazing. It kind of looked exactly like him, just like contour. Frank Gorshin was a great. Uh, one of the Great. best, one of the best personations, yeah. Played sure. the Riddler on Batman, the series. Sure. All right, buddy. I'll talk See to you, you next soon. week.